Chapter Eleven of the Christian's Secret of a Happy Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. The Christian's Secret of a Happy Life by Hannah Whittall Smith. Chapter Eleven difficulties concerning failures the very title of this chapter may perhaps startle some failures they will say we thought there were no failures in this life of faith to this i would answer that there ought not to be and need not be but as a fact there sometimes are and we must deal with facts and not with theories no safe teacher of this interior life ever says that it becomes impossible to sin they only insist that sin ceases to be a necessity and that a possibility of continual victory is opened before us and there are very few if any who do not confess that as to their own actual experience they have at times been overcome by at least a momentary temptation of course in speaking of sin here i mean conscious known sin i do not touch on the subject of sins of ignorance or what is called the inevitable sin of our nature which are all met by the provisions of christ and do not disturb our fellowship with god i have no desire nor ability to treat of the doctrines concerning sin these i will leave with the theologians to discuss and settle while i speak only of the believer's experience in the matter there are many things which we do innocently enough until an increasing light shows them to be wrong and these may all be classed under sins of ignorance but because they are done in ignorance they do not bring us under condemnation and do not come within the range of the present discussion an illustration of this occurred once in my presence a little baby girl was playing about the library one warm summer afternoon while her father was resting on the lounge a pretty inkstand on the table took the child's fancy and unnoticed by anyone she climbed on a chair and secured it then walking over to her father with an air of childish triumph she turned it upside down on the white expanse of his shirt bosom and laughed with glee as she saw the black streams trickling down on every side this was a very wrong thing for the child to do but it could not be called sin for she knew no better had she been older and been made to understand that inkstands were not playthings it would have been sin to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him it is sin and in all i shall say concerning sin in this chapter i desire it to be fully understood that i have reference simply to that which comes within the range of our consciousness misunderstanding then on this point of known or conscious sin opens the way for great dangers in the life of faith when a believer who has as he trusts entered upon the highway of holiness finds himself surprised into sin he is tempted either to be utterly discouraged and to give everything up as lost or else in order to preserve the doctrines untouched he feels it necessary to cover his sin up calling it infirmity and refusing to be candid and above board about it either of these courses is equally fatal to any real growth and progress in the life of holiness the only way is to face the sad fact at once call the thing by its right name and discover if possible the reason and the remedy this life of union with god requires the utmost honesty with him and with ourselves the blessing that the sin itself would only momentarily disturb is sure to be lost by any dishonest dealing with it a sudden failure is no reason for being discouraged and giving up all is lost neither is the integrity of our doctrine touched by it we are not preaching a state but a walk the highway of holiness is not a place but a way sanctification is not a thing to be picked up at a certain stage of our experience and forever after possessed but it is a life to be lived day by day and hour by hour we may for a moment turn aside from a path but the path is not obliterated by our wandering and can be instantly regained and in this life and walk of faith there may be momentary failures that although very sad and greatly to be deplored need not if rightly met disturb the attitude of the soul as to entire consecration and perfect trust nor interrupt more than the passing moment its happy communion with its lord the great point is an instant return to god 
our sin is no reason for ceasing to trust but only an unanswerable argument while we must trust more fully than ever from whatever cause we have been betrayed into failure it is very certain that there is no remedy to be found in discouragement as well might a child who is learning to walk lie down in despair when he has fallen and refuse to take another step as a believer who is seeking to learn how to live and walk by faith give up in despair because of having fallen into sin the only way in both cases is to get right up and try again when the children of israel had met with that disastrous defeat soon after their entrance into the land before the little city of ai they were all so utterly discouraged that we read wherefore the hearts of the people melted and became as water and joshua rent his clothes and fell to the earth upon his face before the ark of the lord until the eventide he and the elders of israel and put dust upon their heads and joshua said alas o lord god wherefore hast thou at all brought this people over jordan to deliver us into the hands of the amorites to destroy us would to god we had been content and dwelt on the other side jordan o lord what shall i say when israel turneth their backs before their enemies for the canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land shall hear of it and shall environ us around and cut off our name from the earth and what wilt thou do unto thy great name what a wail of despair this was and how exactly it is repeated by many a child of god in the present day whose heart because of a defeat melts and becomes as water and who cries out would to god we had been content and dwelt on the other side jordan and predicts for itself further failures and even utter discomfiture before its enemies no doubt joshua thought then as we are apt to think now that discouragement and despair were the only proper and safe condition after such a failure but god thought otherwise and the lord said unto joshua get thee up wherefore liest thou upon thy face the proper thing to do was not to abandon themselves thus to utter discouragement humble as it might look but at once to face the evil and get rid of it in a fresh and immediately to sanctify themselves up sanctify the people is always god's command lie down and be discouraged is always our temptation our feeling is that it is presumptuous and even almost impertinent to go at once to the lord after having sinned against him it seems as if we ought to suffer the consequences of our sin first for a little while and endure the accusings of our conscience and we can hardly believe that the lord can be willing at once to receive us back into loving fellowship with himself a little girl once expressed this feeling to me with a child's outspoken candor she had asked whether the lord jesus always forgave us for our sins as soon as we asked him and i had said yes of course he does just as soon she repeated doubtingly yes i replied the very minute we ask he forgives us well she said deliberately i cannot believe that i should think he would make us feel sorry for two or three days first and then i should think he would make us ask him a great many times and in a very pretty way too not just in common talk and i believe that is the way he does and you need not try to make me think he forgives me right at once no matter what the bible says she only said what most christians think and what is worse what most christians act on making their discouragement and their very remorse separate them infinitely further off from god than their sin would have done yet it is totally contrary to the way we like our children to act toward us that i wonder how we could ever have conceived such an idea of god how a mother grieves when a naughty child goes off alone in despairing remorse and doubts her willingness to forgive and how on the other hand her whole heart goes out in welcoming love to the repentant little one who runs to her at once and begs for forgiveness surely our god felt this yearning love when he said to us return ye backsliding children and i will heal your backslidings the fact is that the same moment which brings the consciousness of sin ought to bring also the confession and the consciousness of forgiveness this is especially essential to an unwavering walk in the life hid with christ in god for no separation from him can be tolerated here for an instant we can only walk this path by looking continually unto jesus moment by moment and if our eyes are turned away from him to look upon our own sin and our own weakness we shall leave the path at once the believer therefore who has as he trusts entered upon this highway if he finds himself overcome by sin must flee with it instantly to the lord he must act on first john one nine if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness 
he must not hide his sin and seek to salve it over with excuses or to push it out of his memory by the lapse of time but he must do as the children of israel did rise up early in the morning and run to the place where the evil thing is hidden and take it out of its hiding place and lay it out before the lord he must confess his sin then he must stone it with stones and burn it with fire and utterly put it away from him and raise over it a great heap of stones that it may be forever hidden from his sight and he must believe then and there that god is according to his word faithful and just to forgive him his sin and that he does do it and further that he also cleanses him from all unrighteousness he must claim by faith an immediate forgiveness and an immediate cleansing and must go on trusting harder and more absolutely than ever as soon as israel's sin had been brought to light and put away as once god's word came again in a message of glorious encouragement fear not neither be thou dismayed see i have given into thy hand the king of ai and his people and his city and his land our courage must rise higher than ever and we must abandon ourselves more completely to the lord that his mighty power may the more perfectly work in us all the good pleasure of his will moreover we must forget our sin as soon as it is thus confessed and forgiven we must not dwell on it and examine it and indulge in a luxury of distress and remorse we must not put it on a pedestal and then walk around it and view it on every side and so magnify it into a mountain that hides god from our eyes we must follow the example of paul and forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before we must press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of god in christ jesus let me recall two contrasting illustrations of these things one was an earnest christian man an active worker in the church who had been living for several months in an experience of great peace and joy he was suddenly overcome by a temptation to treat a brother unkindly having supposed it to be an impossibility that he could ever so sin again he was plunged at once into the deepest discouragement and concluded he had been altogether mistaken and had never entered into the life of full trust at all day by day his discouragement increased until it became despair and he concluded at last that he had never even been born again and gave himself up for lost he spent three years of utter misery going farther and farther away from god and being gradually drawn off into one sin after another until his life was a curse to himself and to all around him his health failed under the terrible burden and fears were entertained for his reason at the end of three years he met a christian lady who understood this truth about sin that i have been trying to explain in a few moments conversation she found out his trouble and at once said you sinned in that act there is no doubt about it and i do not want you to try to excuse it but have you never confessed it to the lord and asked him to forgive you confessed it he exclaimed why it seems to me i have done nothing but confess it and entreat god to forgive me night and day for all these three dreadful years and you have never believed he did forgive you asked the lady no said the poor man how could i for i never felt as if he did but suppose he had said he forgave you would not that have done as well as for you to feel it oh yes replied the man if god said it of course i would believe it very well he does say so was the lady's answer and she turned to the verse we have taken above first john one nine and read it aloud now she continued you have been all these three years confessing and confessing your sin and all the while god's record has been declaring that he was faithful and just to forgive it and to cleanse you and yet you have never once believed it you have been making god a liar all this while by refusing to believe his record the poor man saw the whole thing and was dumb with amazement and consternation and when the lady proposed that they should kneel down and that he should confess his past unbelief and sin and should claim then and there a present forgiveness and a present cleansing he obeyed like one in a maze but the result was glorious the light broke in his darkness vanished and he began aloud to praise god for the wonderful deliverance in a few minutes his soul was enabled to traverse back by faith the whole long weary journey that he had been three years in making and he found himself once more resting in the lord and rejoicing in the fullness of his salvation the other illustration was the case of a christian lady who had been living in the land of promise a few weeks and who had had a very bright and victorious experience suddenly at the end of that time she was overcome by a violent burst of anger for a moment a flood of discouragement swept over her soul the temptation came there now 
that shows it was all a mistake of course you have been deceived about the whole thing and have never entered into the life of faith at all and now you may as well give up altogether for you never can consecrate yourself any more entirely nor trust any more fully than you did this time so it is very plain this life of holiness is not for you these thoughts flashed through her mind in a moment but she was well taught in the ways of god and she said at once yes i have sinned and it is very sad but the bible says that if we confess our sins god is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness and i believe he will do it she did not delay a moment but while still boiling over with anger she ran for she could not walk into a room where she could be alone and kneeling down beside the bed she said lord i confess my sin i have sinned i am even at this very moment sinning i hate it but i cannot get rid of it i confess it with shame and confusion of face to thee and now i believe that according to thy word thou dost forgive and that thou dost cleanse she said it out loud for the inward turmoil was too great for it to be said inside as the words thou dost forgive and thou dost cleanse past her lips the deliverance came the lord said peace be still and there was a great calm a flood of light and joy burst out on her soul the enemy fled and she was more than conquered through him that loved her the whole thing the sin and the recovery from it had occupied not five minutes and her feet trod more firmly than ever in the blessed highway of holiness thus the valley of achor became to her a door of hope and she sang afresh and with deeper meaning her song of deliverance i will sing unto the lord for he hath triumphed gloriously the truth is the only remedy after all in every emergency is to trust in the lord and if this is all we ought to do and all we can do is it not better to do it at once i have often been brought to a stand by the question well what can i do but trust and i have realized at once the folly of seeking for deliverance in any other way by saying to myself i shall have to come to simple trusting in the end and why not come to it at once now in the beginning it is a life and walk of faith we have entered upon and if we fail in it our only recovery must lie in an increase of faith not in a lessening of it let every failure then if any occur drive you instantly to the lord with a more complete abandonment and a more perfect trust and if you do this you will find that sad as it is your failure has not taken you out of the land of rest nor broken for long your sweet communion with him where failure is thus met a recurrence is far more likely to be prevented than where the soul allows itself to pass through a season of despair and remorse if it should however sometimes recur and is always similarly treated it is sure to become less and less frequent till finally it ceases altogether there are some happy souls who learn the whole lesson at once but the blessing is also upon those who take slower steps and gain a more gradual victory having shown the way of deliverance from failure i would now say a little as to the causes of failure in this life of full salvation the causes do not lie in the strength of the temptation nor in our own weakness nor above all in any lack in the power or willingness of our saviour to save us the promise to israel was positive there shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life and the promise to us is equally positive god is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it the men of ai were but few and yet the people who had conquered the mighty jericho fled before the men of ai it was not the strength of their enemy neither had god failed them the cause of their defeat lay somewhere else and the lord himself declares it israel hath sinned and they have also transgressed my covenant which i commanded them for they have even taken of the accursed thing and have also stolen and dissembled also and they have put it even among their own stuff therefore the children of israel cannot stand before their enemies but turn their backs before their enemies it was a hidden evil that conquered them buried under the earth in an obscure tent in that vast army was hidden something against which god had a controversy and this little hidden thing made the whole army helpless before their enemies there is an accursed thing in the midst of thee o israel thou canst not stand before thine enemies until ye take away the accursed thing from among you the lesson here is simply this that anything cherished in the heart which is contrary to the will of god let it seem ever so insignificant or be ever so deeply hidden will cause us to fall before our enemies 
any conscious root of bitterness cherished toward another any self-seeking any harsh judgments any slackness in obeying the voice of the lord any doubtful habits or surroundings these things or any one of them consciously indulged will effectually cripple and paralyze our spiritual life we may have hidden the evil in the most remote corner of our hearts and may have covered it over from our sight refusing even to recognize its existence although we cannot help being all the time secretly aware that it is there we may steadily ignore it in persistent declarations of consecration and full trust we may be more earnest than ever in our religious duties and have the eyes of our understanding opened more and more to the truth and the beauty of the life and walk of faith we may seem to ourselves and to others to have reached an almost impregnable position of victory and yet we may find ourselves suffering bitter defeats we may wonder and question and despair and pray nothing will do any good until the wrong thing is dug up from its hiding place brought out to the light and laid before god the moment therefore that a believer who is walking in this interior life meets with a defeat he must at once seek for the cause not in the strength of that particular enemy but in something behind some hidden want of consecration lying at the very centre of his being just as a headache is not the disease itself but only a symptom of a disease situated in some other part of the body so the failure in such a christian is only the symptom of an evil hidden in probably a very different part of his nature sometimes the evil may be hidden even in what at a cursory glance would look like good beneath apparent zeal for the truth may be hidden a judging spirit or a subtle leaning to our own understanding beneath apparent christian faithfulness may be hidden an absence of christian love beneath an apparently rightful care for our affairs may be hidden a great want of trust in god i believe our blessed guide the indwelling holy spirit is always secretly discovering these things to us by continual little checks and pangs of conscience so that we are left without excuse but it is very easy to disregard his gentle voice and insist upon it to ourselves that all is right while the fatal evil continues hidden in our midst causing defeat in most unexpected quarters a capital illustration of this occurred to me once in my housekeeping we had moved into a new house and in looking over it to see if it was all ready for occupancy i noticed in the cellar a very clean-looking cider cask headed up at both ends i debated with myself whether i should have taken it out of the cellar and opened it to see what was in it but concluded as it seemed empty and looked clean to leave it undisturbed especially as it would have been quite a piece of work to get it up the stairs i did not feel quite easy but reasoned away my scruples and left it every spring and fall when house-cleaning time came on i would remember that cast with a little twinge of my housewifely conscience feeling i could not quite rest in the thought of a perfectly clean house while it remained unopened as how did i know but under its fair exterior it contained some hidden evil still i managed to quiet my scruples on the subject thinking always of the trouble it would involve to investigate it and for two or three years the innocent-looking cask stood quietly in our cellar then most unaccountably moths began to fill our house i used every possible precaution against them and made every effort to eradicate them but in vain they increased rapidly and threatened to ruin everything we had i suspected our carpets as being the cause and subjected them to a thorough cleansing i suspected our furniture and had it newly upholstered i suspected all sorts of impossible things at last the thought of the cask flashed on me at once i had it brought up out of the cellar and the head knocked in and i think it's safe to say that thousands of moths poured out the previous occupant of the house must have headed it up with something in it which bred moths and this was the cause of all my trouble now i believe that in the same way some innocent-looking habit or indulgence some apparently unimportant and safe thing about which however we have now and then little twinges of conscience something which is not brought out fairly into the light and investigated under the searching eye of god lies at the root of most of the failure in this interior life all is not given up some secret corner is kept locked against the entrance of the lord some evil thing is hidden in the recesses of our hearts and therefore we cannot stand before our enemies find ourselves smitten down in their presence in order to prevent failure or to discover its cause if we find we have failed it is necessary to keep continually before us this prayer search me o god and know my heart try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in this way everlasting let me beg of you however dear christians do not think because i have said all this is about failure 
that I believe in it. There is no necessity for it whatever. The Lord Jesus is able, according to the declaration concerning him, to deliver us out of the hands of our enemies, that we may serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him, all the days of our life. Let us then pray, every one of us, day and night. Lord, keep us from sinning, and make us living witnesses of thy mighty power to save to the uttermost. And let us never be satisfied, until we are so pliable in his hands, and have learned so to trust him, that he will be able to make us perfect in every good work to do his will, working in us that which is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to him be glory for ever and ever. Amen. End of chapter 11 Recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida Chapter number 12 of The Christian's Secret of a Happy Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Ramsey. The Christian Secret of a Happy Life by Hannah Whittall Smith. Chapter 12. Is God in Everything? One of the greatest obstacles to an unwavering experience in the interior life is the difficulty of seeing God in everything. People say, I can easily submit to things that come from God, but I cannot submit to man, and most of my trials and crosses come through human instrumentality. Or they say, it is all well enough to talk of trusting, but when I commit a matter to God, man is sure to come in and disarrange it all. And while I have no difficulty in trusting God, I do see serious difficulties in the way of trusting men. This is no imaginary trouble, but it is of vital importance, and if it cannot be met, it does really make the life of faith an impossible and visionary theory. For nearly everything in life comes to us through human instrumentalities, and most of our trials are the result of somebody's failure, or ignorance, or carelessness, or sin. We know God cannot be the author of these things, and yet, unless He is the agent in the matter, how can we say to Him about it, Thy will be done? Besides, what good is there in trusting our affairs to God, if, after all, man is allowed to come in and disarrange them? How is it possible to live by faith if human agencies— in whom it would be wrong and foolish to try to have a prevailing influence in molding our lives. Moreover, things in which we can see God's hand always have a sweetness in them that consoles while it wounds. But the trials inflicted by man are full of nothing but bitterness. What is needed then is to see God in everything, and to receive everything directly from his hands, with no intervention of second causes. And it is to know just this that we might be brought before we can know an abiding experience of entire abandonment and perfect trust. Our abandonment must be to God, not to man, and our trust must be in Him, not in any arm of flesh, or we shall fail at the first trial. The question here confronts us at once. But is God in everything, and have we any warrant from the Scripture for receiving everything from His hands, without regarding the second causes that may have been instrumental in bringing them about? I answer to this, unhesitatingly, yes. To the children of God, everything comes directly from their Father's hand no matter who or what may have been the apparent agents. There are no second causes for them. The whole teaching of scriptures asserts and implies this. Not a sparrow falls to the ground without our Father. The very hairs on our head are all numbered. We are not to be careful about anything because our Father cares for us. We are not to avenge ourselves because our Father has charged himself with our defense. We are not to fear for our Lord is on our side. No one can be against us because he is for us. We shall not want for he is our shepherd. When we pass through the rivers, they shall not overflow us, and when we walk through the fire, we shall not be burned, because he will be with us. He shuts the mouths of lions, that they cannot hurt us. He delivereth and rescueth. He changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. A man's heart is in his hand, and, as the rivers of water, he turneth it whithersoever he will. He ruleth over all the kingdoms of the heathen, and in his hand there is no power and might, so that none is able to withstand him. He ruleth the raging of the sea, when the waves thereof arise, he stilleth them. He bringeth the counsel of the heathen to naught, he maketh the devices of the people of none effect. Whatsoever the Lord pleases, that doeth he, in heaven and in earth, in the seas and all deep places. Lo, these are the parts of his ways. But how a little portion is heard of him! But the thunder of his power who can understand? Hast thou not known? 
hast thou not heard that the everlasting the lord the creator of the earth fainteth not neither is weary there is no searching of his understanding and it is this very god who is declared to be our refuge and strength a very present help in trouble therefore we will not fear though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea though the waters thereof roar and be troubled though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof i will say of the lord he is my refuge and my fortress my god in him i will trust surely he shall deliver thee from the snares of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence he shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings thou shalt trust his trust shall be thy shield and buckler thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night nor for the arrow that flieth by day nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday a thousand shall fall at thy side and ten thousand at thy right side but it shall not come nigh thee because thou hast made the lord which is my refuge even the most high thy habitation and there shall no evil befall thee neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling for he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep in all thy ways be content therefore with such things as ye have for he hath said i will never leave thee nor forsake thee so that we may boldly say the lord is my helper and i will fear not what man shall do unto me to my own mind these scriptures and many others like them settle forever the question as to the power of second causes in the life of the children of god second causes must be under the control of our father and not one of them can touch us except with his knowledge and by his permission it may be the sin of man that originates the action and therefore the thing itself cannot be said to be the will of god but by the time it reaches us it has become god's will for us and must be accepted as directly from his hands no man or company of men no power in earth or heaven can touch that soul which is abiding in christ without first passing through his encircling presence and receiving the seal of his permission if god be for us it matters not who may be against us nothing can disturb or harm us except he shall see that it is best for us and shall stand aside to let it pass an earthly parent's care for his helpless child is a feeble illustration of this if the child is in its father's arms nothing can touch it without that father's consent unless he is too weak to prevent it and even if this should be the case he suffers the harm first in his own person before he allows it to reach his child if an earthly parent would thus care for his helpless little one how much more will our heavenly father whose love is infinitely greater and whose strength and wisdom can never be baffled care for us i am afraid there are some even of god's own children who scarcely think that he is equal to themselves in tenderness and love and thoughtful care and who in their secret thoughts charge him with a neglect and indifference of which they would feel themselves incapable the truth really is that his care is infinitely superior to any possibility of human care and that he who counts the very hairs on our heads and suffers not a sparrow to fall without him takes note of the minutest matters that can affect the lives of his own children and regulates them all according to his own imperfect will let their origin be what they may the instant of this are numberless take joseph what could have seemed more apparently on the face of it to be the result of sin and utterly contrary to the will of god than the action of his brethren in selling him into slavery and yet joseph in speaking of it said as for you ye thought evil against me but god meant it unto good now therefore be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that ye sold me hither for god did send me before you to preserve life it was undoubtedly sin in joseph's brethren but by the time it had reached joseph it had become god's will for him and was in truth though he did not see it then the greatest blessing of his whole life and thus we see how god can make even the wrath of man to praise him and how all things even the sin of others shall work together for good to them that love him i learned this lesson practically and experimentally long years before i knew the scriptural truths concerning it i was attending a prayer meeting held in the interest of the life of faith when a strange lady rose to speak and i looked at her wondering who she could be little thinking she was to bring a message to my soul which would teach me a grand practical lesson she said that she had great difficulty in living the life of faith on account of the second causes that seemed to her to control nearly everything that concerned her her perplexity became so great that at last she began to ask god to teach her the truth about it whether he really was in everything or not after praying this for a few days she had what she described as a vision she thought she was in a perfectly dark place and that there advanced toward her from a distance a body of light which gradually surrounded and enveloped her and everything around her as it approaches a voice seemed to say this is the presence of god this is the presence of god 
While surrounded with this presence, all the great and awful things in life seemed to pass before her. Fighting armies, wicked men, raging beasts, storms and pestilence, sin and suffering of every kind. She shrunk back at first in terror, but soon she saw that the presence of God so surrounded and enveloped herself and each one of those things that not a lion could reach out its paw, nor a bullet fly through the air except as the presence of God moved out of the way to permit it and she saw that if there were ever so thin a film as it were of this glorious presence between herself and the most terrible violence not a hair on her head could be ruffled nor anything touch her except as the presence divided to let the evil through then all the small and annoying things of life passed before her and equally she saw that there also she was so enveloped in this presence of god that not a cross look nor a harsh word nor petty trial of any kind could affect her unless god's encircling presence moved out of the way to let it her difficulty vanished her question was answered for ever god was in everything and to her henceforth there were no second causes she saw that her life came to her day by day hour by hour directly from the hand of god let the agencies which should seem to control it be what they might and never again had she found any difficulty in an abiding consent to his will and an unwavering trust in his care would that it were only possible to make every christian see this truth as plainly as i see it for i am convinced it is the only clue to a competitively restful life nothing else will enable us all to live only in the present moment as we are commanded to do and to take no thought for the morrow nothing else will take all the risk and supposes out of a christian life and enable him to say surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life under god's care we run no risks i once heard of a poor colored woman who earned a precarious living by daily labor but who was joyous triumphant christian ah nancy said a gloomy christian lady to her one day who almost disapproved of her constant cheerfulness and yet envied it ah nancy it is all well enough to be happy now but i should think the only thoughts of your future would sober you only suppose for an instant that you should have a spell of sickness and be unable to work or suppose your present employers should move away and no one else should give you anything to do or suppose stop cried nancy i never suppose the lord is my shepherd and i know i shall not want and honey she added to her gloomy friend it's all dim supposes as is making you so miserable you better give them all up and trust the lord nothing else but this seeing god in everything will make us loving and patient with those who annoy and trouble us they will be to us then only the instruments for accomplishing his tender and wise purposes towards us and we shall even find ourselves at last inwardly thanking them for the blessings they bring nothing else will completely put an end to all murmur or rebelling thoughts christians often would feel at liberty to murmur against god when they would not dare to murmur against god therefore this way of receiving things would make it impossible ever to murmur if our father permits a trial to come it must be because the trial is the sweetest and the best thing that could happen to us and we must accept it with thanks from his dear hand this does not mean however that we must like it or enjoy the trial itself but that we must like god's will in the trial and it is not hard to do this when we have learned to know that his will is the will of love and therefore is always lovely a very good illustration of this may be found in the familiar fact of a mother giving medicine to her dearly loved child but the bottle holds the medicine but the mother gives it and the bottle is not responsible but the mother no matter how full her closet may be of bottles of medicine the mother will not allow one drop to be given to the child unless she believes it will be good for it but when she does believe it will be good for her darling the very depth of her love compels her to force it onto the child no matter how bitter it may taste the human beings around us are often the bottles that held our medicine but it is our father's hand of love that pours out the medicine and compels us to drink it the human bottle is the second cause of our trial but it has no real agency in it for the medicine that these human bottles hold is prescribed for us and given to us by the great physician of our souls who is seeking thereby to heal all our spiritual diseases for instance i know no better medicine to cure the disease of irritability than to be compelled to live with a human bottle of sensitiveness whom we are bound to consider and yield to shall we rebel against the human bottles then shall we not rather take thankfully from our father's hand the medicine they contain and losing sight of the second cause say joyfully thy will be done in everything that comes to us no matter what its source may be this way of seeing our father in everything makes life one long thanksgiving and gives rest of heart and more than that a gaiety of spirit that is unspeakable faber says in his wonderful hymn about the will of god i know not what is to doubt my heart is always gay i run no risk for come what will thou always hast thy way 
since therefore god is sure to have his own way concerning those who abandon themselves to him in perfect trust into what wonderful green pastures of inward rest and besides what blessedly still waters of inward refreshment will he lead all such if the will of god is our will and if he always has his way then we always have our way also and we reign in a perpetual kingdom he who sides with god cannot fail to win every encounter and whether the result shall be joy or sorrow failure or success death or life we may under all circumstances join in the apostle's shout of victory thanks be unto god which always causes us to triumph in christ the will of god thou sweet beloved will of god my anchor ground my fortress hill my spirit silent fair abode in thee i hide and am still o will thou willest good alone lead thou way thou guidest best a little child i follow on i trusting lead upon thy breast thy beautiful sweet will my god holds fast in its sublime embrace my captive's will a gladsome bird prisoned in such a realm of grace within this place of certain good love evermore expands her wings or nesting in thy perfect choice abides content with what it brings o sweetest burden lightest yoke it lifts it bears my happy soul it giveth wings to this poor heart my freedom is thy grand control upon god's will i lay me down as child upon its mother's breast no silken couch nor softest bed could ever give me such sweet rest thy wonderful grand will my god with triumphs now i make it mine and love shall cry a jealous yes to every dear command of thine End of chapter twelve recording by elizabeth ramsey Chapter Thirteen of the Christian Secret of a Happy Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeff Chestnut. The Christian Secret of a Happy Life by Hannah Whitehall Smith. Chapter Thirteen, Bondage or Liberty. It is a fact beyond question that there are two kinds of Christian experience, one of which is an experience of bondage, and the other an experience of liberty. In the first case the soul is controlled by a stern sense of duty, and obeys the law of God either from fear of punishment or from expectation of wages. In the other case the controlling power is an inward life principle that works out, by the force of its own motions or instincts, the will of the divine life-giver without fear of punishment or hope of reward in the first the christian is a servant and works for hire in the second he is a son and works for love there ought not it is true to be this contrast in the experience of christians for to walk at liberty is plainly their only right and normal condition but as we have to deal with what is rather than with what ought to be we cannot shut our eyes to the sad condition of bondage in which so many of god's children pass a large part of their christian lives the reason of this and the remedy for it are not difficult to find the reason is legality and the remedy is christ nowhere do we find those two forms or stages of christian life more fully developed and contrasted than in the epistle to the galatians the occasion of its being written was that some jewish brethren had come among the churches in galatia and by representing that certain forms and ceremonies were necessary to their salvation had tried to draw them away from the liberty of the gospel and with these teachers peter had allowed himself to unite therefore paul reproves not only the galatians but also peter himself neither peter nor the galatians had committed any moral sin but they had committed a spiritual sin they had got into a wrong attitude of soul toward god a legal attitude they had begun as christians generally do in the right attitude that is they had entered by the hearing of faith into the spiritual life but when it came to a question of how they were to live in this life they had changed the ground they had sought to substitute works for faith having 
begun in the spirit they were now seeking to be made perfect by the flesh they had in short descended in their christian living from the plane of life to the plane of law an illustration will help us to understand this here are two men who neither of them steal outwardly their actions are equally honest but inwardly there is a vital difference one man has a dishonest nature that wants to steal and is only deterred by the fear of a penalty while the other possesses an honest nature that hates thieving and could not be induced to steal even by the hope of a reward the one is honest in the spirit the other is honest only in the flesh no words are needed to say of which sort the christian life is meant to be we are however continually tempted to forget that it is not what men do that is the vital matter but rather what they are in christ jesus neither legal observances avail anything nor the omission of legal observances but a new creature god is a great deal more concerned about our really being new creatures than about anything else because he knows that if we are right as to our inward being we shall certainly do right as to our outward actions we may in fact sometimes even do right without being right at all and it is very evident that no doing of this kind has any vitality in it nor is of any real account the essential thing therefore is character and doing is valuable only as it is an indication of being paul was grieved with the galatian christians because they seemed to have lost sight of this vital truth that the inward life the new creature was the only thing that availed they had begun on this plane but they had fallen from grace to a lower plane where the oldness of the letter was put in place of the newness of the spirit christ is become of no effect unto you whosoever of you are justified by the law ye are fallen from grace this passage is the only one in which the expression fallen from grace is used in the new testament and it means that the galatians had made the mistake of thinking that something else beside christ was necessary for their right christian living the jewish brethren who had come among them had taught them that christ alone was not enough but that obedience to the ceremonial law must be added they had therefore imported as being necessary for salvation some ceremonies out of the jewish ritual and had tried to compel the gentiles to live as do the jews modern christians are greatly surprised at them and wonder how they could have been so legal but is there not the same temptation to legality under a different form among these same modern christians they added the ceremonial law we add resolutions or agonizing or christian work or church-going or religious ceremonies of one sort or another and what is there therefore to choose between us and them it does not make much difference what you add the wrong thing is to add anything at all we are full of condemnation of the jews religion because it frustrates the grace of god and makes christ to be dead in vain by depending upon outward deeds and outward ceremonies to bring salvation but i fear there is a great deal of the jews religion mixed up with the christian religion now just as there was among these galatian christians and that the grace of god is as much frustrated by our legality as theirs although ours may manifest itself in a slightly different form the following contrasts may help some to understand the difference between these two kinds of religion and may also enable them to discover where the secret of their own experience of legal bondage lies the law says this do and thou shalt live the gospel says live and then thou shalt do the law says pay me that thou owest the gospel says i frankly forgive thee all the law says make you a new heart and a new spirit the gospel says a new heart i will give you and a new spirit i will put within you the law says 
thou shalt love the lord thy god with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind the gospel says herein is love not that we loved god but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins the law says cursed is every one who continueth not in all things written in the book of the law to do them the gospel says blessed is the man whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered the law says the wages of sin is death the gospel says the gift of god is eternal life through jesus christ our lord the law demands holiness the gospel gives holiness the law says do the gospel says done the law extorts the unwilling service of the bondsman the gospel wins the loving service of a son and freeman the law makes blessings the result of obedience the gospel makes obedience the result of blessings the law places the day of rest at the end of the week's work the gospel places it at the beginning the law says if the gospel says therefore the law was given for the restraint of the old man the gospel was given to bring liberty to the new man under the law salvation was wages under the gospel salvation is a gift these two forms of the religious life begin at exactly opposite ends the religion of legality is as though a man should decide to have an apple orchard and should try to make one by first getting some apples of the kind desired and then getting a tree and fastening the apples on its branches and then getting roots to fasten to the trunk and finally purchasing a field in which to plant his manufactured tree that is first the fruit second the branches third the root fourth the field but the religion of grace follows a different order it begins at the root and grows up and blossoms out into flowers and fruit paul tells us that the law is our schoolmaster not our savior and he emphasizes the fact that it is our schoolmaster only for the purpose of bringing us to christ for after faith in christ is come he declares we are no longer to be under a schoolmaster he uses the contrast between a servant and a son as an illustration of his meaning wherefore he says thou art no more a servant but a son and he entreats us because of this to stand fast in the liberty wherewith christ hath made us free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage it is as if a woman had been a servant in a house paid for her work in weekly wages and under the law of her master whom she had tried to please but towards whom her service had been one of duty only finally however the master offers her his love and lifts her up from the place of a servant to be his bride and to share his fortunes at once the whole spirit of her service is changed she may perhaps continue to do the same things that she did before but she does them now altogether from a different motive the old sense of duty is lost in the new sense of love the cold word master is transformed into the loving word husband and it shall be at that day saith the lord that thou shalt call me ishi my husband and shalt call me no more bali my lord but imagine this bride beginning after a while to look back upon her low estate and to be so overwhelmed by the retrospect as to feel unworthy of union with her husband and to lose consequently the inward sense of this union who can doubt that very soon the old sense of working for wages would drive out the new sense of working for love and in spirit the old name of my master would again take the place of the new name of my husband we exclaim at the folly of such a course but is it not this just what happens to many christians now the servitude of duty takes the place of the service of love and god is looked upon as the stern taskmaster who demands our obedience instead of the loving father who wins it 
we all know that nothing so destroys the sweetness of any relation as the creeping in of this legal spirit the moment a husband and wife cease to perform their services to each other out of a heart of love and union and begin to perform them from a sense of duty alone that moment the sweetness of the union is lost and the marriage tie becomes a bondage and things that were a joy before are turned into crosses this lies at the bottom i think of the current idea of taking up the cross in the christian church we think it means doing something we ought to do but dislike to do and such service is thought to be very meritorious toward god although we all know very well that we would not endure it a moment as toward ourselves what wife could endure it if her husband should use toward her the language that christians are continually using toward the lord if he should say for instance every morning as he went out to business i am going to work for you to-day but i wish you to know that it is a very great cross and i hardly know how to bear it or what husband would like such language from his wife no wonder paul was alarmed when he found there was a danger of a legal spirit such as this creeping into the church of christ legal christians do not deny christ they only seek to add something to christ their idea is christ and something besides perhaps it is christ and good works or christ and earnest feelings or christ and clear doctrines or christ and certain religious performances all these are good in themselves and good as the results or fruits of salvation but to add anything to christ no matter how good it may be as the procuring cause of salvation is to deny his completeness and to exalt self men will undergo many painful self-sacrifices rather than take the place of utter helplessness and worthlessness a man will gladly be a saint simeon stylites or even a fakir if only it is self that does it so that self may share the glory and a religion of bondage always exalts self it is what i do my efforts my wrestlings my faithfulness but a religion of liberty leaves self nothing to glory in it is all christ and what he does and what he is and how wonderfully he saves the child does not boast of itself but of its father and mother and our souls can make their boast in the lord when in this life of liberty we have learned to know that he and he alone is the sufficient supply for our every need we are the children of god and therefore of course his heirs and our possessions come to us not by working for them but by inheritance from our father ah dear friends how little some of you act like the heirs of god how poverty-stricken you are and how hard you work for the little you do possess you may perhaps point to the results of your legal working or your asceticism which it is true do seem to have a show of wisdom in will worship and humility and neglecting of the body as being a proof of the rightness of your course but i am convinced that whatever really good results there are have come in spite of and not because of your legal working i had a friend once whose christian life was a life of bondage she worked for her salvation harder than any slave ever worked to purchase his freedom among other things she never felt as if the day could go right for herself or any of her family unless she started it with a long season of wrestling and agonizing and conflict winding up her machine i called it one day we were talking about it together and she was telling me of the hardness and bondage of her christian life and was wondering what the bible could mean when it said christ's yoke was easy and his burden light i told her that i thought she must have got things wrong somehow that the bible always expressed the truth of our relationships with god by using figures that did not admit of any such wrestlings and agonizings as she described what would you think i asked of children that had to wrestle and agonize with their parents every morning for their necessary food and clothing or of sheep that had to wrestle with their shepherd before they could secure the necessary care 
of course i see that would be all wrong she said but then why do i have such good times after i have gone through these conflicts this puzzled me for a moment but then i asked what brings about those good times finally why finally she replied i come to the point of trusting the lord suppose you should come to that point to begin with i asked oh she replied with sudden illumination i never until this minute thought that i might christ says that except we become as little children we cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven but it is impossible to get the child spirit until the servant spirit has disappeared notice i do not say the spirit of service but the servant spirit every good child is filled with the spirit of service but ought not to have anything of the servant spirit the child serves from love the servant works for wages if a child of loving parents should get the idea that its parents would not give it food and clothing unless it earned them in some way all the sweetness of the relationship between the parent and child would be destroyed i knew a little girl who did get this idea and who went around the neighborhood asking at the doors for work that she might earn a little money to buy herself some clothes it nearly broke the hearts of her parents when they discovered it legal christians grieve the heart of their heavenly father far more than they dream by letting the servant spirit creep in in their relations with him as soon as we begin to work for our living in spiritual things we have stepped out of the son's place into the servants and have fallen from grace one servant of whom we read in the bible thought his lord was a hard master and the spirit of bondage makes us think the same now how many christians there are who have bowed their necks to the yoke of christ as to a yoke of bondage and have read his declaration that his yoke is easy as though it were a fairy tale and gone on their way never dreaming that it was meant to be actually realized as fact in truth so deeply is the idea that the christian life is a species of bondage ingrained in the church that whenever any of the children of god find themselves walking at liberty they at once begin to think there must be something wrong in their experience because they no longer find anything to be a cross to them as well might the wife think there must be something wrong in her love for her husband when she finds all her services for him are a pleasure instead of a trial sometimes i think that the whole secret of the christian life that i have been trying to describe is revealed in the child relationship nothing more is needed than just to believe that god is as good a father as the best ideal earthly father and that the relationship of a christian to him is just the same as that of a child to its parents in this world children do not need to carry about in their own pockets the money for their support if the father has plenty that satisfies them and is a great deal better than if it were in the child's own possession since in that case it might get lost in the same way it is not necessary for christians to have all their spiritual possessions in their own keeping it is far better that their riches should be stored up for them in christ and that when they want anything they should receive it direct from his hands he of god is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption and apart from him we have nothing when people are comparative strangers to one another they cannot with any comfort receive great gifts from each other but when they are united in spirit with a bond of true love between them then no matter how great the gifts may be that pass from one to the other they can be accepted without any feeling of embarrassment or obligation on either side this principle holds good in the spiritual life when christians are living far off from god they cannot be brought to accept any great gifts from him they feel as if they were too unworthy and did not deserve such gifts and even when he puts the blessing into their very laps as it were their false humility prevents them from seeing it and they go on their way without it 
but when christians get near enough to the lord to feel the true spirit of adoption they are ready to accept with delight all the blessings he has in store for them and never think anything too much to receive for then they discover that he is only eager as parents are to pour out every good gift upon his children and that in fact all things are theirs because they are christ's and christ is god's sometimes a great mystery is made out of the life hid with christ in god as though it were a strange mystical thing that ordinary people could not understand but this contrast between bondage and liberty makes it very plain it is only to find out that we really are no more servants but sons and practically to enter into the blessed privileges of this relationship all can understand what is to be a little child there is no mystery about that god did not use the figure of father and children without knowing all that this relationship implies and those therefore who know him as their father know the whole secret they are their father's heirs and may enter now into possession of all that is necessary for their present needs they will therefore be very simple in their prayers lord they will say i am thy child and i need such and such things my child he answers all things are thine in christ come and take just what thou needest where the executors are honorable men the heirs to an estate are not obliged to wrestle for their inheritance the executors are appointed not to keep them out of it but to help them into possession of it i sometimes think christians look upon our lord as someone appointed to keep them out of their possessions instead of the one who has come to bring them in they little know how such an implication grieves and dishonors him it is because legal christians do not know the truth of their relationship to god as children to a father and do not recognize his fatherly heart toward them that they are in bondage when they do recognize it the spirit of bondage becomes impossible to them our liberty must come therefore from an understanding of the mind and thoughts of god towards us what are the facts of the case if he has called us only to the servant's place then the christians whose lives are lives of weary bondage are right but if he has called us to be children and heirs if we are his friends his brethren his bride how sadly and grievously wrong we are in being entangled under any yoke of bondage whatever no matter how pious a yoke it may seem to be the thought of bondage is utterly abhorrent to any of earth's true relationships and surely it must be more repugnant to heavenly relationship it will not of course hinder the final entrance of the poor enslaved soul into its heavenly rest but it will i am sure put it into the sad condition of those who are described in first corinthians three eleven through fifteen their work shall be burned and they shall suffer loss yet they themselves shall be saved but so as by fire against such there is no law is the divine sentence concerning all who live and walk in the spirit and you shall find it most blessedly true in your own experience if you will but lay aside all self-effort and self-dependence of every kind and will consent to let christ live in you and work in you and be your indwelling life the man who lives by the power of an inward righteous nature is not under bondage to the outward law of righteousness but he who is restrained by the outward law alone without the inward restraint of a righteous nature is a slave to the law the one fulfills the law in his soul and is therefore free the other rebels against the law in his soul and is therefore bound i would that every child of god did but know the deliverance from bondage which i have tried to set forth let me entreat of you my readers to abandon yourselves so utterly to the lord jesus christ that he may be able to work in you all the good pleasure of his will and may by the law of the spirit of life in himself deliver you from every other law that could possibly enslave you end of chapter eight recording by jeff chestnut
Chapter 14 of The Christian Secret of a Happy Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeff Chestnut. The Christian Secret of a Happy Life by Hannah Whitehall Smith. Chapter 14 Growth. One great objection made against those who advocate this life of faith is that they do not teach a growth in grace. They are supposed to teach that the soul arrives in one moment at a state of perfection beyond which there is no advance, and that all the exhortations in the scriptures that points toward growth and development are rendered void by this teaching. Since exactly the opposite of this is true, I will try, if possible, to answer these objections, and to show what seems to me the scriptural way of growing, and in what place the soul must be in order to grow. The text, which is most frequently quoted, is Second Peter 3.18, But grow in grace, and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now this text expresses exactly what we who teach this life of faith believe to be God's will for us, and what we also believe he has made it possible for us to experience. We accept, in their very fullest meaning, all the commands and promises concerning our being no more children, and our growing up into Christ in all things, until we come unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. We rejoice that we need not continue always to be babes needing milk, but that we may, by reason of use and development, become such as have need of strong meat, skillful in the word of righteousness, and able to discern both good and evil. And none would grieve more than we ourselves at the thought of any finality in the Christian life beyond which there could be no advance. But then we believe in a growing that does really produce continually progressing maturity, and in a development that, as a fact, does bring forth ripe fruit. We expect to reach the aim set before us, and if we do not find ourselves on the way towards it, we feel sure there must be some fault in our growing. No parent would be satisfied with the growth of his child if day after day and year after year it remained the same helpless babe it was in the first months of its life. And no farmer would feel comfortable under such growing of his grain as should stop short at the blade, and never produce the ear or the full corn in the ear. Growth, to be real, must be progressive, and the days and weeks and months should bring a development and increase of maturity in the thing growing. But is this the case with a large part of that which is called growth in grace? Does not the very Christian who is the most strenuous in his longings and his efforts after this growth too often find that, at the end of the year, he is not as far on in his Christian experience as at the beginning, and that his zeal and his devotedness and his separation from the world are not as whole-souled or complete as when his Christian life first began? I was once urging upon a company of Christians the duty and privilege of an immediate and definite step into the land of promise, when a lady of great intelligence interrupted me with what she evidently felt to be a complete rebuttal of all I had been saying, by exclaiming, Ah, but Mrs. Smith, I believe in growing in grace. How long have you been growing? I asked. About twenty-five years, was her answer. And how much more unworldly and devoted to the Lord are you now than when your Christian life began? I continued. Alas, was the answer, I fear I am not nearly so much so. And with this answer her eyes were open to see that at all events her way of growing had not been successful, but quite the reverse. The trouble with her, and with every other such case, is simply this. They are trying to grow into grace instead of in it. They are like a rose-bush, planted by a gardener in the hard stony path, with a view to its growing into the flower-bed, 
and which has of course dwindled and withered in consequence instead of flourishing and maturing the children of israel wandering in the wilderness are a perfect picture of this sort of growing they were traveling for about forty years taking many weary steps and finding but little rest from their wanderings and yet at the end of it all were no nearer the promised land than they were at the beginning when they started on their wanderings at kadesh barnea they were at the borders of the land and a few steps would have taken them into it when they ended their wanderings in the plains of moab they were also at its borders only with this difference that now there was a river to cross which at first there would not have been all their wanderings and fightings in the wilderness had not put them in possession of one inch of the promised land in order to get possession of this land it was necessary first to be in it and in order to grow in grace it is necessary first to be planted in grace when once in the land however their conquest was rapid and when once planted in grace the growth of the spiritual life becomes vigorous and rapid beyond all conceiving for grace is a most fruitful soil and the plants that grow therein are plants of a marvelous growth they are tended by a divine husbandman and are warm by the sun of righteousness and watered by the dew from heaven surely it is no wonder that they bring forth fruit some an hundredfold some sixtyfold some thirtyfold but it will be asked what is meant by growing in grace it is difficult to answer this question because so few people have any conception of what the grace of god really is to say that it is free unmerited favor only expresses a little of its meaning it is the unhindered wondrous boundless love of god poured out upon us in an infinite variety of ways without stint or measure not according to our deserving but according to his measureless heart of love which passeth knowledge so unfathomable are its heights and depths i sometimes think a totally different meaning is given to the word love when it is associated with god from that which we so well understand in its human application we seem to consider that divine love is hard and self-seeking and distant concerned about its own glory and indifferent to the fate of others but if ever human love was tender and self-sacrificing and devoted if ever it could bear and forbear if ever it could suffer gladly for its loved one if ever it was willing to pour itself out in a lavish abandonment for the comfort or pleasure of its objects then infinitely more is divine love tender and self-sacrificing and devoted and glad to bear and forbear and suffer and eager to lavish its best of gifts and blessings upon the objects of its love put together all the tenderest love you know of dear reader the deepest you have ever felt and the strongest that has ever been poured out upon you and heap upon it all the love of all the loving human hearts in the world and then multiply it by infinity and you will begin perhaps to have some faint glimpses of the love and grace of god in order to grow in grace therefore the soul must be planted in the very heart of this divine love enveloped by it steeped in it it must let itself out to the joy of it and must refuse to know anything else it must grow in the apprehension of it day by day it must entrust everything to its care and must have no shadow of doubt but that it will surely order all things well to grow in grace is opposed to all growth in self-dependence or self-effort to all legality in fact of every kind it is to put our growing as well as everything else into the hands of the lord and leave it with him it is to be so satisfied with our husbandman and with his skill and wisdom that not a question will cross our minds as to his mode of treatment or his plan of cultivation it is to grow as the lilies grow or as the babies grow without care and without anxiety to grow by the power of an inward life principle that cannot help but grow to grow because we live and therefore must grow 
to grow because he who has planted us has planted a growing thing and has made us on purpose to grow. Surely this is what our Lord meant when he said, Consider the lilies, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Or when he says again, Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? There is no effort in the growing of a babe or of a lily. The lily does not toil nor spin, it does not stretch nor strain, it does not make any effort of any kind to grow. It is not conscious even that it is growing. But by an inward life principle, and through the nurturing care of God's providence, and the fostering of caretaker or gardener, by the heat of the sun and the falling of the rain, it grows and buds and blossoms into the beautiful plant God meant it to be. The result of this sort of growing in the Christian life is sure. Even Solomon, in all his glory, our Lord says, was not arrayed like one of God's lilies. Solomon's array cost much toiling and spinning and gold and silver in abundance, but the lily's array costs none of these. And though we may toil and spin to make for ourselves beautiful spiritual garments, and may strain and stretch in our efforts after spiritual growth, we shall accomplish nothing. For no man by taking thought can add one cubit to his stature, and no array of ours can ever equal the beautiful dress with which the great husbandman clothes the plants that grow in his garden of grace and under his fostering care. Could I but make each one of my readers realize how utterly helpless we are in this matter of growing, I am convinced a large part of the strain would be taken out of many lives at once. Imagine a child possessed of the monomania that he would not grow unless he made some personal effort after it, and who should insist upon a combination of ropes and pulleys whereby to stretch himself up to the desired height. He might, it is true, spend his days and years in a weary strain, but after all there would be no change in the inexorable fiat. No man, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature and his weary efforts would be only wasted if they did not actually hinder the longed-for end. Imagine a lily trying to clothe itself in beautiful colors and graceful lines, and drawing to its aids, as so many of God's children try to do, the wisdom and strength of all the lilies around it. I think such a lily would very soon become a chronic case of spiritual perplexities and difficulties, similar to some that are familiar to every Christian worker. Neither child nor lily is ever found doing such a vain and foolish thing as trying to grow, but I fear many of God's children are doing exactly this foolish thing. They know that they ought to grow, and they feel within them an instinct that longs for growth, but instead of letting the divine husbandman care for their growing, as it is surely his business to do, they think to accomplish it by their own toiling and spinning and stretching and straining, and in consequence they pass their lives in a round of wearisome self-efforts that exhausts their energies while all the time they find themselves, to their infinite grief, growing backward rather than forward. Ye flowerets of the field, Siddhartha said, who turn your tender faces to the sun, what secret know ye? that ye grow content. What we all need is to consider the flowers of the field and learn their secret. Grow by all means, dear Christians, but grow, I beseech you, in God's way, which is the only effectual way. See to it that you are planted in grace, and then let the divine husbandman cultivate you in his own way and by his own means. Put yourselves out in the sunshine of his presence, and let the dew of heaven come down upon you, and see what will be the result. Leaves and flowers and fruit must surely come in their season, for your husbandman is skillful, and he never fails in his harvesting. Only see to it that you oppose no hindrance to the shining of the sun of righteousness, or the falling of the dew from heaven, 
the thinnest covering may serve to keep off the sunshine and the dew and the plant may wither even where these are most abundant and so also the slightest barrier between your soul and christ may cause you to dwindle and fade as a plant in a cellar or under a bushel keep the sky clear open wide every avenue of your being to receive the blessed influences your divine husbandman may bring to bear upon you bask in the sunshine of his love drink of the waters of his goodness keep your face upturned to him as the flowers do to the sun look and your soul shall live and grow but it may be objected here that we are not inanimate flowers but intelligent human beings with personal powers and personal responsibilities this is true and it makes this important difference that what the flower is by nature we must be by an intelligent and free surrender to be one of god's lilies means an interior abandonment of the rarest kind it means that we are to be infinitely passive and yet infinitely active also passive as regards self and its workings active as regards attention and response to god it is very hard to explain this so as to be understood but it means that we must lay down all the activity of the creature as such and must let only the activities of god work in us and through us and by us self must step aside to let god work you need make no efforts to grow therefore but let your efforts instead be all concentrated on this that you abide in the vine the divine husbandman who has the care of the vine will care also for you who are his branches and will so prune and purge and water and tend you that you will grow and bring forth fruit and your fruit shall remain and like the lily you shall find yourself arrayed in apparel so glorious that that of solomon will be as nothing to it what if you seem to yourselves to be planted at this moment in a desert soil where nothing can grow put yourselves absolutely into the hands of the good husbandman and he will at once begin to make that very desert blossom as the rose and will cause springs and fountains of water to start up out of its sandy wastes for the promise is true that the man that trusts in the lord shall be as a tree planted by the waters and that spreadeth out her roots by the river and shall not see when the heat cometh but her leaf shall be green and shall not be careful in the year of drought neither shall cease from yielding fruit it is the great prerogative of our divine husbandman that he is able to turn any soil whatever it may be like into the soil of grace the moment we put our growing into his hands he does not need to transplant us into a different field but right where we are with just the circumstances that surround us he makes his sun to shine and his dew to fall upon us and transforms the very things that were before our greatest hindrances into the chiefest and most blessed means of our growth i care not what the circumstances may be his wonder-working power can accomplish this and we must trust him with it all surely he is a husbandman we can trust and if he sends storms or winds or rains or sunshine all must be accepted as his hands with the most unwavering confidence that he who has undertaken to cultivate us and to bring us to maturity knows the very best way of accomplishing his end and regulates the elements which are at all his disposal expressly with a view to our most rapid growth let me entreat of you then to give up all your efforts after growing and simply to let yourself grow leave it all to the husbandman whose care it is and who alone is able to manage it no difficulties in your case can baffle him if you will only put yourselves absolutely into his hands and let him have his own way with you no dwarfing of your growth in the years that are past no apparent dryness of your inward springs of life no crookedness or deformity in your development can in the least mar the perfect work that he will accomplish his own gracious promise to his backsliding children assures you of this i will heal their backsliding he says 
I will love them freely, for mine anger is turned away from him. I will be as dew unto Israel. He shall grow as the lily, and cast forth his roots as Lebanon. His branches shall spread, and his beauty shall be as the olive tree, and his smell as Lebanon. They that dwell under his shadow shall return. They shall revive as the corn, and grow as the vine. The scent thereof shall be as the wine of Lebanon. And again he says, Be not afraid, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring. For the tree beareth her fruit, the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. And the floor shall be full of wheat, and the vats shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten. And ye shall eat in plenty, and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God, that hath dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. Oh, that you could know just what your Lord meant when he said, Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. Surely these words give us a picture of a life and growth far different from the ordinary life and growth of Christians, a life of rest, and a growth without effort, and yet a life and a growth crowned with glorious results. And to every soul that will thus become a lily in the garden of the Lord, and will grow as the lilies grow, the same glorious array will be as surely given as was given to them and they will know the fulfillment of that wonderful mystical passage concerning their beloved that he feedeth among the lilies. I feel as weak as a violet, alone with the awful sky. Winds wander and dews drop earthward. Rains fall, suns rise and set, earth whirls, and all but to prosper a poor little violet. We may rest assured of this, that all the resources of God's infinite grace will be brought to bear on the growing of the tiniest flower in his spiritual garden, as certainly as they are in his earthly creation. And as the violet abides peacefully in its little place, content to receive its daily portion without concerning itself about the wandering of the winds or the falling of the rain, so must we repose in the present moment as it comes to us from God, contented with our daily portion, and without anxious thought as to anything that may be whirling around us in God's glorious universe, sure that all things will be made to prosper for us. This is the kind of growth in grace in which we who have entered into a life of full trust believe, a growth without care or anxiety on our part, but a growth which does actually grow, which blossoms out into flower and fruit, and becomes like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season, whose leaf also does not wither, and who prospers in whatsoever he doeth. And we rejoice to know that there are growing up now in the Lord's heritage many such plants, who, as the lilies behold the face of the sun and grow thereby, are by beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, being changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Should you ask such how it is they grow so rapidly, and with such success, their answer would be that they are not concerned about their growing, and are hardly conscious that they do grow, that their Lord has told them to abide in Him, and has promised that, if they do thus abide, they shall certainly bring forth much fruit, and that they are concerned, therefore, only about the abiding, which is their part, and are content to leave the cultivating, and the growing, and the training, and the pruning, to their good husbandman, who alone is able to manage these things, or to bring them about. You will find that such souls are not engaged in watching self, but in looking unto Jesus. They do not toil and spin for their spiritual garments, but leave themselves in the hands of the Lord to be arrayed as it may please Him. Self-effort and self-dependence are at an end with them. Formerly, they tried to be not only the garden, but the gardener also as well, and undertook to fulfill the duties of both. Now they are content to be what they are, 
the garden only, and not the gardener, and they are willing to leave the gardener's duties to the divine husbandman, who alone is responsible for their rightful performance. Their interest in self is gone, transferred over into the hands of another, and self, in consequence, has become nothing to them more and more, and Christ alone is seen to be all in all. And the blessed result is that not even Solomon, in all his glory, was arrayed as these shall be. Let us look at the subject practically. We all know that growing is not a thing of effort, but is the result of an inward life principle of growth. All the stretching and pulling in the world could not make a dead oak grow, but a live oak grows without stretching. It is plain, therefore, that the essential thing is to get within you the growing life, and then you cannot help but grow. And this life is the life hid with Christ in God, the wonderful divine life of an indwelling Holy Ghost. Be filled with this, dear believer, and whether you are conscious of it or not, you must grow. You cannot help growing. Do not trouble about your growing, but see to it that you have the growing life. Abide in the vine. Let the life from him flow through all your spiritual veins. Interpose no barrier to his mighty life-giving power, working in you all the good pleasure of his will. Yield yourself up utterly to his lovely control. Put your growing into his hands as completely as you have put all your other affairs. Suffer him to manage it as he will. Do not concern yourself about it, nor even think of it. Do not, as children do, keep digging up your plants to see if they are growing. Trust the divine husbandman absolutely and always. Accept each moment's dispensation as it comes to you from his dear hands, as being the needed sunshine or dew for that moment's growth. Say a continual yes to your Father's will. And finally, in this, as in all the other cares of your life, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God that passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. If your growth in grace is of this sort, dear reader, you will surely know sooner or later a wonderful growing, and you will come to understand as you cannot now, it may be what the psalmist meant when he said, The righteous shall flourish like the palm tree, he shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be fat and flourishing. End of chapter 14 Recording by Jeff Chestnut Chapter 15 of The Christian Secret of a Happy Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeff Chestnut. The Christian Secret of a Happy Life by Hannah Whitehall Smith. Chapter 15 Service. There is, perhaps, no part of Christian experience where a greater change is known upon entering into this life hid with Christ in God than in the matter of service. In all the ordinary forms of Christian life, service is apt to have more or less of bondage in it. That is, it is done purely as a matter of duty, and often as a trial and a cross. Certain things, which at first may have been a joy and a delight, become after a while weary tasks performed faithfully, perhaps, but with much secret disinclination, and many confessed or unconfessed wishes that they need not be done at all, or at least that they need not be done so often. The soul finds itself saying instead of the may I of love, the must I of duty. The yoke which was at first easy begins to gall, and the burden feels heavy instead of light. 
one dear christian expressed it once to me in this way when i was first converted she said i was so full of joy and love that i was only too glad and thankful to be allowed to do anything for my lord and i eagerly entered every open door but after a while as my early joy faded away and my love burned less fervently i began to wish i had not been quite so eager for i found myself involved in lines of service that were gradually becoming very distasteful and burdensome to me since i had begun them i could not very well give them up without exciting great remark and yet i longed to do so increasingly i was expected to visit the sick and pray beside their beds i was expected to attend prayer meetings and speak at them i was expected in short to be always ready for every effort in christian work and the sense of these expectations bowed me down continually at last it became so unspeakably burdensome to me to live the sort of christian life i had entered upon and was expected by all around me to live that i felt as if any kind of manual labor would have been easier and i would have infinitely preferred scrubbing all day on my hands and knees to being compelled to go through the treadmill of my daily christian work i envied she said the servants in the kitchen and the women at the wash tubs this may seem to some like a strong statement but does it not present a vivid picture of some of your own experiences dear christian have you never gone to your work as a slave to his daily task believing it to be your duty and that therefore you must do it but rebounding like an india rubber ball back into your real interests and pleasures the moment your work was over you have known of course that this was the wrong way to feel and have been thoroughly ashamed of it but still you have seen no way to help it you have not loved your work and could you have done so with an easy conscience you would have been glad to give it up altogether or if this does not describe your case perhaps another picture will you do love your work in the abstract but in the doing of it you find so many cares and responsibilities connected with it and feel so many misgivings and doubts as to your own capacity or fitness that it becomes a very heavy burden and you go to it bowed down and weary before the labor has even begun then also you are continually distressing yourself about the results of your work and greatly troubled if they are not just what you would like and this of itself is a constant burden now from all these forms of bondage the soul that enters fully into the blessed life of faith is entirely delivered in the first place service of any sort becomes delightful to it because having surrendered its will into the keeping of the lord he works in it to will and to do of his good pleasure and the soul finds itself really wanting to do the things god wants it to do it is always very pleasant to do the things we want to do let them be ever so difficult of accomplishment or involve ever so much of bodily weariness if a man's will is really set on a thing he regards with a sublime indifference the obstacles that lie in the way of his reaching it and laughs to himself at the idea of any opposition or difficulties hindering him how many men have gone gladly and thankfully to the ends of the world in search of worldly fortunes or to fulfill worldly ambitions and have scorned the thought of any cross connected with it and how many mothers have congratulated themselves and rejoiced over the honor done in their sons in seeing them promoted to some place of power and usefulness in their country's service although it has involved perhaps years of separation and a life of hardship for their dear ones and yet these same men and these very mothers would have felt and said that they were taking up crosses too heavy almost to be borne had the service of christ required the same sacrifice of home and friends and worldly ease it is altogether the way we look at things whether we think they are crosses or not and i am ashamed to think that any christian should ever put on a long face and shed tears over doing a thing for christ which a worldly man would be only too glad to do for money what we need in the christian life is to get believers to want to do god's will as much as other people want to do their own will 
and this is the idea of the gospel it is what god intended for us and it is what he has promised in describing the new covenant in hebrews eight six through thirteen he says it shall no more be the old covenant made on sinai that is a law given from the outside controlling a man by force but it shall be a law written within constraining a man by love i will put my laws he said into their minds and write them in their hearts this can mean nothing but that we shall love his law for anything written in our hearts we must love and putting it into our minds is surely the same as god working in us to will and to do of his good pleasure and means that we shall will what god wills and shall obey his sweet commands not because it is our duty to do so but because we ourselves want to do what he wants us to do nothing could possibly be conceived more effectual than this how often have we thought when dealing with our children oh if i could only get inside of them and make them want to do just what i want how easy it would be to manage them then how often in practical experience we have found that to deal with cross-grained people we most carefully avoid suggesting our wishes to them but must in some way induce them to suggest the thing themselves sure that there will then be no opposition to contend with and we who are by nature a stiff-necked people always rebel more or less against a law from outside of us while we joyfully embrace the same law springing up within god's way of working therefore is to get possession of the inside of a man to take control and management of his will and to work it for him then obedience is easy and a delight and service becomes perfect freedom until the christian is forced to exclaim this happy service who could dream earth had such liberty what you need to do then dear christian if you are in bondage in the matter of service is to put your will over completely into the hands of your lord surrendering to him the entire control of it say yes lord yes to everything and trust him so to work in you to will as to bring your whole wishes and affections into conformity with his own sweet and lovable and most lovely will i have seen this done often in cases where it looked beforehand an utterly impossible thing in one case where a lady had been for years rebelling fearfully against a little act of service which she knew was right but which she hated i saw her out of the depths of her despair and without any feeling whatever give her will in that matter up into the hands of her lord and begin to say to him thy will be done thy will be done and in one short hour that very thing began to look sweet and precious to her it is wonderful what miracles god works in wills that are utterly surrendered to him he turns hard things into easy and bitter things into sweet it is not that he puts easy things in the place of hard but he actually changes the hard thing into an easy one and makes us love to do the thing we before so hated while we rebel against the yoke and try to avoid it we find it hard and galling but when we take the yoke upon us with a consenting will we find it easy and comfortable it is said of ephraim that at one time he was like a bullock unaccustomed to the yoke but that afterwards when he had submitted to the yoke he was as an heifer that is taught and loveth to tread out the corn many christians as i have said love god's will in the abstract but carry great burdens in connection with it from this also there is deliverance in the wonderful life of faith for in this life no burdens are carried no anxieties felt the lord is our burden-bearer and upon him we must lay off every care he says in effect be careful for nothing but make your requests known to me and i will attend to them all be careful for nothing he says not even your service above all i should think our service because we know ourselves to be so utterly helpless in regard to it that even if we were careful 
it would not amount to anything. What have we to do with thinking whether we are fit or not? The master workman surely has a right to use any tool he pleases for his own work, and it is plainly not the business of the tool to decide whether it is the right one to be used or not. He knows, and if he chooses to use us, of course we must be fit. And in truth, if we only knew it, our chief fitness is in our utter helplessness. His strength is made perfect, not in our strength, but in our weakness. Our strength is only a hindrance. I was once visiting an idiot asylum and saw the children going through dumbbell exercises. Now we all know that it is a very difficult thing for idiots to manage their movements. They have strength enough generally, but no skill to use this strength, and as a consequence cannot do much. And in these dumbbell exercises this deficiency was very apparent. They made all sorts of awkward movements. Now and then, by a happy chance, they would make a movement in harmony with the music and the teacher's directions, but for the most part all was out of harmony. One little girl, however, I noticed, who made perfect movements. Not a jar or break disturbed the harmony of her exercises. And the reason was not that she had more strength than the others, but that she had no strength at all. She could not so much as close her hands over the dumbbells, nor lift her arms, and the master had to stand behind her and do it all. She yielded up her members as instruments to him, and his strength was made perfect in her weakness. He knew how to go through those exercises, for he himself had planned them, and therefore when he did it, it was done right. She did nothing but yield herself up utterly into his hands, and he did it all. The yielding was her part. The responsibility was all his. It was not her skill that was needed to make harmonious movements, but only his. The question was not of her capacity, but of his. Her utter weakness was her great strength. To me this is a very striking picture of our Christian life, and it is no wonder, therefore, that Paul could say, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Who would not glory in being so utterly weak and helpless, that the Lord Jesus Christ should find no hindrance to the perfect working of his mighty power through us and in us. Then, too, if the work is his, the responsibility is his also, and we have no room left for worrying about results. Everything in reference to it is known to him, and he can manage it all. Why not leave it all with him, then, and consent to be treated like a child and guided where to go? It is a fact that the most effectual workers I know are those who do not feel the least care or anxiety about their work, but who commit it all to their dear master, and asking him to guide them moment by moment in reference to it, trust him implicitly for each moment's needed supplies of wisdom and of strength. To look at them you would almost think, perhaps, that they were too free from care where such mighty interests are at stake. But when you have learned God's secret of trusting, and see the beauty and the power of the life that is yielded up to his working, you will cease to condemn, and will begin to wonder how any of God's workers can dare to carry the burdens or assume the responsibilities which he alone is able to bear. Some may object that the Apostle Paul spoke of the care of the churches coming upon him. But we must not fail to remember that it was the constant habit of the Apostle to roll every care off on the Lord, and thus, while full of care, to be without carefulness. There are one or two other bonds in service from which this life of trust delivers us. We find out that no one individual is responsible for all the work in the world, but only for a small share. Our duty ceases to be universal and becomes personal and individual. The master does not say to us, Go and do everything, but he marks out an especial path for each one of us and gives to each one of us an especial duty. 
there are diversities of gifts in the kingdom of god and these gifts are divided to every man according to his several ability i may have five talents or two or only one i may be called to do twenty things or only one my responsibility is simply to do that which i am called to do and nothing more the steps of a good man are ordered of the lord not his way only but each separate step in that way many christians make the further mistake of looking upon every act of service as of perpetual obligation they think because it was right for them to give a tract to one person in a railway train for instance that therefore they are always to give tracts to everybody and in this way they burden themselves with an impossible duty there was a young christian once who because she had been sent to speak a message to one soul whom she met in a walk supposed it was a perpetual obligation and thought she must speak about their souls to every one she met in her walks this was of course impossible and as a consequence she was soon in hopeless bondage about it she became absolutely afraid to go outside of her own door and lived in perpetual condemnation at last she disclosed her distress to a friend who was instructed in the ways of god with his servants and this friend told her she was making a great mistake that the lord had his own especial work for each especial workman and that the servants in a well-regulated household might as well each one take it upon themselves to try to do the work of all the rest as for the lord's servants to think they were each one under obligation to do everything he told her just to put herself under the lord's personal guidance as to her work and trust him to point out to her each particular person to whom he would have her speak assuring her that he never puts forth his own sheep without going before them and making a way for them himself she followed this advice and laid the burden of her work on the lord and the result was a happy pathway of daily guidance in which she was led in the much blessed work for her master and was able to do it all without a care or a burden because he led her out and prepared the way before her i have been very much instructed myself by thinking of the arrangements of our own households when we appoint a servant for an especial part of the work of the household we want him to attend to that alone and not run all over the house trying to attend to the work of all the other servants it would make endless confusion in any earthly household if the servants were to act in this fashion and it makes no less confusion in the divine household our part in the matter of service seems to me just like making the junction between the machinery and the steam engine the power is not in the machinery but in the steam disconnected from the engine the machinery is perfectly useless but let the connection be made and the machinery goes easily and without effort because of the mighty power there is behind it thus the christian life when it is the development of the divine life working within becomes an easy and natural life most christians live on a strain because their wills are not fully in harmony with the will of god the connection is not perfectly made at every point and it requires an effort to move the machinery but when once the connection is fully made and the law of the spirit of life in christ jesus can work in us with all its mighty power we are then indeed made free from the law of sin and death and we shall know the glorious liberty of the children of god another form of bondage as to service from which the life of faith delivers the soul is in reference to the after reflections which always follow any christian work these after reflections are of two sorts either the soul congratulates itself upon its success and is lifted up or it is distressed over its failure and is utterly cast down one of these is sure to come and of the two i think the former is the more to be dreaded although the latter causes at the time the greater suffering but in the life of trust neither will trouble us for having committed ourselves in our work to the lord we shall be satisfied to leave it to him and shall not think about ourselves in the matter at all 
years ago I came across this sentence in an old book. Never indulge, at the close of an action, in any self-reflective acts of any kind, whether of self-congratulation or of self-despair. Forget the things that are behind the moment they are past, leaving them with God. This has been of unspeakable value to me. When the temptation comes, as it mostly does to every worker after the performance of any service to indulge in these reflections, either of one sort or the other, I turn from them at once and positively refuse to think about my work at all, leaving it with the Lord to overrule the mistakes and to bless it as he chooses. I believe there would be far fewer Blue Mondays for ministers of the gospel than there are now if they would adopt this plan, and I am sure all workers would find their work far less wearing. To sum it all up, then, what is needed for happy and effectual service is simply to put your work into the Lord's hands and leave it there. Do not take it to Him in prayer, saying, Lord, guide me, Lord, give me wisdom, Lord, arrange for me, and then rise from your knees and take the burden all back and try to guide and arrange for yourself. Leave it with the Lord, and remember that what you trust to Him you must not worry over nor feel anxious about. Trust and worry cannot go together. If your work is a burden, it is because you are not trusting it to Him. But if you do trust it to Him, you will surely find that the yoke He puts upon you is easy, and the burden He gives you to carry is light. And, even in the midst of a life of ceaseless activity, you shall find rest to your soul. If the Divine Master only had a band of such workers as this, there is no limit to what he might do with them. Truly, one such would chase a thousand, and two would put ten thousand to flight, and nothing would be impossible to them. For it is nothing with the Lord to help, whether with many or with them that have no power, if only he can find instruments that are fully abandoned to his working. May God raise up such an army speedily, and may you, my dear reader, enroll your name among this band, and, yielding yourself unto God as one who is alive from the dead, may every one of your members be also yielded unto him as instruments of righteousness, to be used by him as he pleases. End of chapter 15 Recording by Jeff Chestnut Chapter 16 of The Christian Secret of a Happy Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeff Chestnut. The Christian Secret of a Happy Life by Hannah Whitehall Smith. Chapter 16 its practical results in the daily walk and conversation. If all that has been written in the foregoing chapters on the life hid with Christ be true, its results in the practical daily walk and conversation ought to be very marked, and the people who have entered into the enjoyment of it ought to be, in very truth, a peculiar people zealous of good works. My son, now with God, once wrote to a friend something to this effect, that we are God's witnesses necessarily, because the world will not read the Bible, but they will read our lives, and that upon the report these give will very much depend their belief in the divine nature of the religion we possess. This age is essentially an age of facts, and all scientific inquiries are being increasingly turned from theories to realities. If, therefore, our religion is to make headway in the present time, it must be proved to be more than a theory, and we must present to the investigation of the critical minds of our age the realities of lives transformed by the mighty power of God, working in them all the good pleasure of His will. 
I desire, therefore, to speak very solemnly of what I conceive to be the necessary fruits of a life of faith such as I have been describing, and to press home to the hearts of every one of my readers their personal responsibility to walk worthy of the high calling wherewith they have been called. I think that I may speak to some of you, at least, as personal friends, for I feel sure we have not gone thus far together through these pages without their having grown in your hearts, as there has in mine, a tender personal interest and longing for one another, that we may in everything show forth the praises of him who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. As a friend, then, to friends, I speak, and I am sure I shall be pardoned if I go into some details of our daily lives which may seem of secondary importance, and which make up the largest part of them. The standard of practical holy living has been so low among Christians that the least degree of real devotedness of life and walk is looked upon with surprise, and often even with disapprobation, by a large portion of the church. And, for the most part, the followers of the Lord Jesus Christ are satisfied with a life so conformed to the world, and so like it in almost every respect, that, to a casual observer, no difference is discernible. But we, who have heard the call of our God to a life of entire consecration and perfect trust, must do differently. We must come out from the world and be separate, and must not be conformed to it in our characters or in our lives. We must set our affections on heavenly things, not on earthly ones, and must seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, surrendering everything that would interfere with this. We must walk through the world as Christ walked. We must have the mind that was in Him. As pilgrims and strangers, we must abstain from fleshly lusts that war against the soul. As good soldiers of Jesus Christ, we must disentangle ourselves inwardly from the affairs of this life, that we may please him who hath chosen us to be soldiers. We must abstain from all appearance of evil. We must be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven us. We must not resent injuries or unkindness, but must return good for evil, and turn the other cheek to the hand that smites us. We must take always the lowest place among our fellow men, and seek, not our own honor, but the honor of others. We must be gentle and meek and yielding, not standing up for our own rights, but for the rights of others. We must do everything, not for our own glory, but for the glory of God. And, to sum it all up, since he who hath called us is holy, so we must be holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Some Christians seem to think that all the requirements of a holy life are met when there is very active and successful Christian work. And because they do so much for the Lord in public, they feel a liberty to be cross and ugly and unchristian-like in private. But this is not the sort of Christian life I am depicting. If we are to walk as Christ walked, it must be in private as well as in public, at home as well as abroad and it must be every hour, all day long, and not at stated periods or on certain fixed occasions. We must be just as Christ-like to our servants as we are to our minister, and just as good in our counting-house as we are in our prayer meeting. It is in daily, homely living, indeed, that practical piety can best show itself, and we may well question any professions that fail under this test of daily life. A cross Christian, or an anxious Christian, a discouraged gloomy Christian, a doubting Christian, a complaining Christian, an exacting Christian, a selfish Christian, 
a cruel, hard-hearted Christian, a self-indulgent Christian, a Christian with a sharp tongue or bitter spirit, all these may be very earnest in their work and may have honorable places in the church, but they are not Christ-like Christians, and they know nothing of the realities of which this book treats, no matter how loud their professions may be. The life hid with Christ in God is a hidden life as to its source, but it must not be hidden as to its practical results. People must see that we walk as Christ walked if we say that we are abiding in Him. We must prove that we possess that which we profess. We must, in short, be real followers of Christ and not theoretical ones only. And this means a great deal. It means that we must really and absolutely turn our backs on everything that is contrary to the perfect will of God. It means that we are to be a peculiar people, not only in the eyes of God, but in the eyes of the world around us, and that, wherever we go, it will be known from our habits, our tempers, our conversation, and our pursuits, that we are followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, and are not of the world, even as he was not of the world. We must no longer look upon our money as our own, but as belonging to the Lord to be used in his service. We must not feel at liberty to use our energies exclusively in the pursuit of worldly means, but must recognize that, if we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all needful things shall be added unto us. We shall find ourselves forbidden to seek the highest places or to strain after worldly advantages. We shall not be permitted to make self, as heretofore, the center of all our thoughts and all our aims. Our days will have to be spent, not in serving ourselves, but in serving the Lord, and we shall find ourselves called upon to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ, and all our daily homely duties will be more perfectly performed than ever, because whatever we do will be done, not with eye service as men-pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Into all this we shall undoubtedly be led by the Spirit of God if we give ourselves up to His guidance. But unless we have the right standard of Christian life set before us, we may be hindered by our ignorance from recognizing His voice. And it is for this reason I desire to be very plain and definite in my statements. I have noticed that wherever there has been a faithful following of the Lord in a consecrated soul, several things have, sooner or later, inevitably followed. Meekness and quietness of spirit become, in time, the characteristics of the happy life. A submissive acceptance of the will of God, as it comes in the hourly events of each day, is manifested pliability in the hands of God to do or to suffer all the good pleasure of His will, sweetness under provocation, calmness in the midst of turmoil and bustle, a yielding to the wishes of others and an insensibility to slights and affronts, absence of worry or anxiety, deliverance from care and fear, all these and many other similar graces are invariably found to be the natural outward development of that inward life which is hid with Christ in God. Then, as to the habits of life, we always see such Christians sooner or later laying aside thoughts of self and becoming full of consideration for others. They dress and live in simple, healthful ways. They renounce self-indulgent habits and surrender all purely fleshly gratifications. Some helpful work for others is taken up, and useless occupations are dropped out of the life. God's glory and the welfare of His creatures become the absorbing delight of the soul. The voice is dedicated to Him, to be used in singing His praises. The purse is placed at His disposal. 
the pen is dedicated to write for him the lips to speak for him the hands and the feet to do his bidding year after year such christians are seen to grow more unworldly more serene more heavenly minded more transformed more like christ until even their very faces express so much of the beautiful inward divine life that all who look at them cannot but take knowledge of them that they live with jesus and are abiding in him i feel sure that to each one of you have come some divine intimations or foreshadowings of the life i here describe have you not begun to feel dimly conscious of the voice of god speaking to you in the depths of your soul about these things has it not been a pain and a distress to you of late to discover how full your lives are of self has not your soul been plunged into inward trouble and doubt about certain dispositions or pursuits in which you have been formerly accustomed to indulge have you not begun to feel uneasy with some of your habits of life and to wish that you could do differently in certain respects have not paths of devotedness and of service begun to open out before you with the longing thought oh that i could walk in them all these questions and doubts and this inward yearning are the voice of the good shepherd in your heart seeking to call you out of that which is contrary to his will let me entreat of you not to turn away from his gentle pleadings you little know the sweet paths into which he means to lead you by these very steps nor the wonderful stores of blessedness that lie at their end or you would spring forward with an eager joy to yield to every one of his requirements the heights of christian perfection can only be reached by each moment faithfully following the guide who is to lead you there and he reveals the way to us one step at a time in the little things of our daily lives asking only on our part that we yield ourselves up to his guidance be perfectly pliable then in his dear hands to go where he entices you and to turn away from all from which he makes you shrink obey him perfectly the moment you are sure of his will and you will soon find that he is leading you out swiftly and easily into such a wonderful life of conformity to himself that it will be a testimony to all around you beyond what you yourself will ever know i knew a soul thus given up to follow the lord whithersoever he might lead her who in a very little while travelled from the depths of darkness and despair into the realization and actual experience of a most blessed union with the lord jesus christ out of the midst of her darkness she consecrated herself to the lord surrendering her will up altogether to him that he might work in her to will and to do of his own good pleasure immediately he began to speak to her by his spirit in her heart suggesting to her some little acts of service for him and troubling her about certain things in her habits and her life showing her where she was selfish and unchristlike and how she could be transformed she recognized his voice and yielded to him each thing he asked for the moment she was sure of his will her swift obedience was rewarded by a rapid progress and day by day she was conformed more and more to the image of christ until very soon her life became such a testimony to those around her that some even who had begun by opposing and disbelieving were forced to acknowledge that it was of god and were won to a similar surrender and finally in a little while it came to pass so swiftly had she gone that her lord was able to reveal to her wandering soul some of the deepest secrets of his love and to fulfill to her the marvelous promise of acts one five by giving her to realize the baptism of the holy ghost think you she has ever regretted her whole-hearted following of him or that aught but thankfulness and joy can ever fill her soul 
when she reviews the steps by which her feet have been led to this place of wondrous blessedness, even though some of them may have seemed at the time hard to take? Ah, dear soul, if thou wouldst know a like blessing, abandon thyself, like her, to the guidance of thy divine Master, and shrink from no surrender for which he may call. The perfect way is hard to flesh, it is not hard to love, if thou wert sick for want of God, how swiftly wouldst thou move! Surely thou canst trust him, and if some things may be called for that look to thee of but little moment, and not worthy thy Lord's attention, remember that he sees not as man seeth, and that things small to thee may be in his eyes the key and the clue to the deepest springs of thy being. No life can be complete that fails in its little things. A look, a word, a tone of voice even, however small they may seem to human judgment, are often of vital importance in the eyes of God. Thy one great desire is to follow Him fully. Canst thou not say, then, a continual yes to all His sweet commands, whether small or great, and trust him to lead thee by the shortest road to thy fullest blessedness? My dear friend, whether thou knew it or not, this, and nothing less than this, is what thy consecration meant. It meant inevitable obedience. It meant that the will of thy God was henceforth to be thy will under all circumstances and at all times. It meant that from that moment thou didst surrender thy liberty of choice, and gave thyself up utterly into the control of thy Lord. It meant an hourly following of him, whithersoever he might lead thee, without any turning back. All this and far more was involved in thy surrender to God, and now I appeal to thee to make good thy word. Let everything else go that thou mayest live out, in a practical daily walk in conversation, the Christ-life thou hast dwelling within thee. Thou art united to thy Lord by a wondrous tie. Walk, then, as he walked, and show to the unbelieving world the blessed reality of his mighty power to save, by letting him save thee to the very uttermost. Thou needst not fear to consent to this, for he is thy Saviour, and his power is to do it all. He is not asking thee, in thy poor weakness, to do it thyself. He only asks thee to yield thyself to him, that he may work in thee, and through thee, by his own mighty power. Thy part is to yield thyself. His part is to work and never, never will he give thee any command that is not accompanied by ample power to obey it. Take no thought for the morrow in this matter, but abandon thyself with a generous trust to the Good Shepherd, who has promised never to call his own sheep out into any path without himself going before them to make the way easy and safe. Take each little step as he makes it plain to thee. Bring all thy life in each of its details to him to regulate and guide. Follow gladly and quickly the sweet suggestions of his spirit in thy soul. And day by day thou wilt find him bringing thee more and more into conformity with his will in all things. Molding thee and fashioning thee as thou art able to bear it, into a vessel unto his honor, sanctified and meet for his use, and fitted to every good work. So shall be given to thee the sweet joy of being an epistle of Christ, known and read of all men. And thy light shall shine so brightly that men seeing not thee but thy good works, shall glorify not thee, but thy Father which is in heaven. But thou art making me, I thank thee, sire. What thou hast done and doest thou knowest well, and I will help thee, 
gently in thy fire. I will lie burning on thy potter's wheel. I will whirl patient, though my brain should reel. Thy grace shall be enough the grief to quell, and growing strength perfect through weakness dire. I have not knowledge, wisdom, insight, thought, nor understanding, fit to justify thee in thy work, O perfect. Thou hast brought me up to this, and lo, what thou hast wrought, I cannot comprehend, but I can cry. O enemy, the Maker hath not done, one day thou shalt behold, and from the sight shall run. Thou workest perfectly, and if it seem, some things are not so well, tis but because they are too loving deep, too lofty wise, for me, poor child, to understand their laws. My highest wisdom half is but a dream, my love runs helpless like a falling stream. Thy good embraces ill, and lo, its illness dies. George MacDonald End of chapter 16 Recording by Jeff Chestnut Chapter 17 of The Christian Secret of a Happy Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeff Chestnut. The Christian Secret of a Happy Life by Hannah Whitehall Smith. Chapter 17. THE JOY OF OBEDIENCE Having spoken of some of the difficulties in this life of faith, let me now speak of some of its joys, and foremost among these stands the joy of obedience. Long ago I met somewhere with this sentence, Perfect obedience would be perfect happiness if only we had perfect confidence in the power we were obeying. I remember being struck with the saying as the revelation of a possible, although hitherto undreamed of, way of happiness, and often afterwards, even when full of inward rebellion, did that saying recur to me as the vision of a rest, and yet of a possible development that would soothe and at the same time satisfy all my yearnings. Need I say that this rest has been revealed to me now, not as a vision, but as a reality? and that I have seen in the Lord Jesus the Master to whom we may yield up our implicit obedience, and taking his yoke upon us, may find our perfect rest. You little know, dear hesitating soul, of the joy you are missing. The Master has revealed himself to you, and is calling for your complete surrender, and you shrink and hesitate. A measure of surrender you are willing to make, and think indeed it is fit and proper that you should, but an utter abandonment without any reserves seems to you too much to be asked for. You are afraid of it. It involves too much, you think, and is too great a risk. To be measurably obedient, you desire. To be perfectly obedient, appalls you. Then, too, you see other souls who seem able to walk with easy consciences in a far wider path than that which appears to be marked out for you, and you ask yourself why this need be. It seems strange, and perhaps hard to you, that you must do what they need not, and must leave undone what they have liberty to do. Ah, dear Christian, this very difference between you is your privilege though you do not yet know it. Your Lord says, He that hath my commandments, and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. You have his commandments. Those you envy have them not. You know the mind of your Lord about many things, in which, as yet, they are walking in darkness. 
is not this a privilege is it a cause for regret that your soul is brought into such near and intimate relations with your master that he is able to tell you things which those who are farther off may not know do you not realize what a tender degree of intimacy is implied in this there are many relations in life that require from the different parties only very moderate degrees of devotion we may have really pleasant friendships with one another and yet spend a large part of our lives in separate interests and widely differing pursuits when together we may greatly enjoy one another's society and find many congenial points but separation is not any especial distress to us and other and more intimate friendships do not interfere there is not enough love between us to give us either the right or the desire to enter into and share one another's most private affairs a certain degree of reserve and distance seems to be the suitable thing in such relations as these but there are other relations in life where all this is changed the friendship becomes love the two hearts give themselves to each other to be no longer two but one a union of soul takes place which makes all that belongs to one the property of the other separate interests and separate paths in life are no longer possible things that were lawful before become unlawful now because of the nearness of the tie that binds the reserve and distance suitable to mere friendship become fatal in love love gives all and must have all in return the wishes of one become binding obligations to the other and the deepest desire of each heart is that it may know every secret wish or longing of the other in order that it may fly on the wings of the wind to gratify it do such as these chafe under this yoke which love imposes do they envy the cool calm reasonable friendships they see around them and regret the nearness into which their souls are brought to their beloved one because of the obligations it creates do they not rather glory in these very obligations and inwardly pity with a tender yet exulting joy the poor far-off ones who dare not come so near is not every fresh revelation of the wishes of the loved one a fresh delight and privilege and is any path found hard which their love compels them to travel ah dear soul if you have ever known this even for a few hours in any earthly relation if you have ever loved any of your fellow human beings enough to find sacrifice and service on their behalf a joy if a whole-souled abandonment of your will to the will of another has ever gleamed across you as a blessed and longed-for privilege or as a sweet and precious reality then by all the tender longing love of your heavenly lover would i entreat you to let it be so towards christ he loves you with more than the love of friendship as a bridegroom rejoices over his bride so does he rejoice over you and nothing but the bride's surrender will satisfy him he has given you all and he asks for all in return the slightest reserve will grieve him to the heart he spared not himself and how can you spare yourself for your sake he poured out in a lavish abandonment all that he had and for his sake you must pour out all that you have without stint or measure oh be generous in your self-surrender meet his measureless devotion for you with a measureless devotion to him be glad and eager to throw yourself unreservedly into his loving arms and to hand over the reins of government to him whatever there is of you let him have it all give up forever everything that is separate from him consent to resign from this time forward all liberty of choice and glory in the blessed nearness of union which makes this enthusiasm of devotedness not only possible but necessary have you never longed to lavish your love and attentions upon some one far off from you in position or circumstances with whom you were not intimate enough for any closer approach 
have you not felt a capacity for self-surrender and devotedness that has seemed to burn within you like a fire and yet had no object upon which it dared to lavish itself have not your hands been full of alabaster boxes of ointment very precious which you have never been near enough to any heart to pour out if then you are hearing the loving voice of your lord calling you out into a place of nearness to himself that will require a separation from all else and that will make an enthusiasm of devotedness not only possible but necessary will you shrink or hesitate will you think it hard that he reveals to you more of his mind than he does to others and that he will not allow you to be happy in anything that separates you from himself do you want to go where he cannot go with you or to have pursuits which he cannot share no no a thousand times no you will spring out to meet his lovely will with an eager joy even his slightest wish will become a binding law to you that it would fairly break your heart to disobey you will glory in the very narrowness of the path he marks out for you and will pity with an infinite pity the poor far-off ones who have missed this precious joy the obligations of love will be to you its sweetest privileges and the right you have acquired to lavish the uttermost wealth of abandonment of all that you have upon your lord will seem to lift you into a region of unspeakable glory the perfect happiness of perfect obedience will dawn upon your soul and you will begin to know something of what jesus meant when he said i delight to do thy will o my god but do you think the joy in this will be all on your side has the lord no joy in those who have thus surrendered themselves to him and who love to obey him ah my friends we are not able to understand this but surely the scriptures reveal to us glimpses of the delight the satisfaction the joy our lord has in us which rejoice our souls with their marvelous suggestions of blessedness that we should need him is easy to comprehend that he should need us seems incomprehensible that our desire should be toward him is a matter of course but that his desire should be toward us passes the bounds of human belief and yet he says it and what can we do but believe him he has made our hearts capable of this supreme overmastering affection and has offered himself as the object of it it is infinitely precious to him so much does he value it that he has made it the first and chiefest of all his commandments that we should love him with all our might and with all our strength continually at every heart he is knocking asking to be taken in as the supreme object of love wilt thou have me he says to the believer to be thy beloved wilt thou follow me into suffering and loneliness and endure hardness for my sake and ask for no reward but my smile of approval and my word of praise wilt thou throw thyself with a passion of abandonment into my will wilt thou give up to me the absolute control of thyself and of all thou hast wilt thou be content with pleasing me and me only may i have my way with thee in all things wilt thou come into so close a union with me as to make a separation from the world necessary wilt thou accept me for thy heavenly bridegroom and leave all others to cleave only to me in a thousand ways he makes this offer of union with himself to every believer but all do not say yes to him other loves and other interests seem to them too precious to be cast aside they do not miss heaven because of this but they miss an unspeakable present joy you however are not one of these from the very first your soul has cried out eagerly and gladly to all his offers yes lord yes you are more than ready to pour out upon him all your richest treasures of love and devotedness you have brought to him an enthusiasm of self-surrender 
that may perhaps disturb and distress the so-called prudent and moderate Christians around you. Your love makes necessary a separation from the world of which a lower love cannot even conceive. Sacrifices and services are possible and sweet to you that could not come into the grasp of a more half-hearted devotedness. The life of love upon which you have entered gives you the right to a lavish outpouring of your all upon your beloved one. An intimacy and friendship which more distant souls cannot enter upon become now not only your privilege, but your duty. Your Lord claims from you, because of your union with Him, far more than He claims of them. What to them is lawful, love has made unlawful for you. To you He can make known His secrets, and to you He looks for an instant response to every requirement of His love. Oh, it is wonderful, the glorious, unspeakable privilege upon which you have entered! How little it will matter to you if men shall hate you, and shall separate you from their company, and shall reproach you and cast out your name as evil for his dear sake! You may well rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven, for if you are a partaker of his suffering, you shall also be of his glory. In you he is seen of the travail of his soul, and is satisfied. Your love and devotedness are his precious reward for all he has done for you. It is unspeakably sweet to him. Do not be afraid, then, to let yourself go in a heart-whole devotedness to your Lord that can brook no reserves. Others may not approve, but he will, and that is enough. Do not stint or measure your obedience or your service. Let your heart and your hand be as free to serve him as his heart and hand were to serve you. Let him have all there is of you, body, soul, mind, spirit, time, talents, voice, everything. Lay your whole life open before him that he may control it. Say to him each day, Lord, enable me to regulate this day so as to please thee. Give me spiritual insight to discover what is thy will in all the relations of my life. Guide me as to my pursuits, my friendships, my reading, my dress, my Christian work. Do not let there be a day nor an hour in which you are not consciously doing his will and following him wholly. A personal service to your Lord such as this will give a halo to the poorest life and gild the most monotonous existence with a heavenly glow. Have you ever grieved that the romance of youth is so soon lost in the hard realities of the world? Bring Christ thus into your life and into all its details, and a romance far grander than the brightest days of youth could ever know will thrill your soul and nothing will seem hard or stern again. The meanest life will be glorified by this. Often, as I have watched a poor woman at her wash-tub, and have thought of all the disheartening accessories of such a life, and have been tempted to wonder why such lives need to be, there has come over me, with a thrill of joy, the recollection of this possible glorification of it, and I have realized that even this homely life lived in Christ and with Christ, following him whithersoever he might lead, would be filled with a spiritual romance that would make every hour of it grand, while to the most wealthy or most powerful of earthly lives nothing more glorious could be possible. Christ himself, when he was on earth, declared the truth that there was no blessedness equal to the blessedness of obedience. And it came to pass, as he spake these things, a certain woman of the company lifted up her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bare thee, and the paps which thou hast sucked. But he said, Yea, rather, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. 
more blessed even than to have been the earthly mother of our Lord, or to have carried him in our arms and nourished him in our bosoms. And who could ever measure the bliss of that? Is it to hear and obey his will? May our surrendered hearts reach out with an eager delight to discover and embrace the lovely will of our loving God. End of chapter 17 Recording by Jeff Chestnut Chapter 18 of The Christian Secret of a Happy Life This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeff Chestnut The Christian Secret of a Happy Life by Hannah Whitehall Smith Chapter 18 Divine Union All the dealings of God with the soul of the believer are in order to bring it into oneness with himself, that the prayer of our Lord may be fulfilled, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. This divine union was the glorious purpose in the heart of God for his people before the foundation of the world. It was the mystery hid from ages and generations. It was accomplished in the death of Christ. It has been made known by the scriptures, and it is realized as an actual experience by many of God's dear children but not by all. It is true of all, and God has not hidden it or made it hard, but the eyes of many are too dim, and their hearts too unbelieving for them to grasp it. It is therefore for the purpose of bringing his people into the personal and actual realization of this that the Lord calls upon them so earnestly and so repeatedly to abandon themselves to him that he may work in them all the good pleasure of his will. All the previous steps in the Christian life lead up to this. The Lord has made us for it, and until we have intelligently apprehended it, and have voluntarily consented to embrace it, the travail of his soul for us is not satisfied, nor have our hearts found their destined and real rest. The usual course of Christian experience is pictured in the history of the disciples. First they were awakened to see their condition and their need, and they came to Christ and gave in their allegiance to him. Then they followed him, worked for him, believed in him, and yet how unlike him! Seeking to be set up one above the other, running away from the cross, misunderstanding his mission and his words, forsaking their Lord in time of danger, but still sent out to preach recognized by him as his disciples, possessing power to work for him. They knew Christ only after the flesh, as outside of them, their Lord and Master, but not yet their life. Then came Pentecost, and these same disciples came to know him as inwardly revealed, as one with them in actual union, their very indwelling life. Henceforth he was to them Christ within, working in them to will and to do of his good pleasure, delivering them, by the law of the Spirit of his life, from the bondage to the law of sin and death under which they had been held. No longer was it, between themselves and him, a war of wills and a clashing of interests. One will alone animated them, and that was his will. One interest alone was dear to them, and that was his. They were made one with him. And surely all can recognize this picture, though perhaps as yet the final stage of it has not been fully reached. You may have left much to follow Christ, dear reader. You may have believed on him, and worked for him, and loved him, and yet may not be like him. 
allegiance you know and confidence you know but not yet union there are two wills two interests two lives you have not yet lost your own life that you may live only in his once it was i and not christ next it was i and christ perhaps now it is even christ and i but has it come yet to be christ only and not i at all if not shall i tell you how it may if you have followed me through all the previous chapters in this book you will surely now be ready to take the definite step of faith which will lead your soul out of self and into christ and you will be prepared to abide in him forever and to know no life but his all you need therefore is to understand what the scriptures teach about this marvelous union that you may be sure it is really intended for you if you read such passages as first corinthians three sixteen know ye not that ye are the temple of god and that the spirit of god dwelleth in you and then look at the opening of the chapter and see to whom these wonderful words are spoken even to babes in christ who were yet carnal and walked according to men you will see that this soul union of which i speak this unspeakably glorious mystery of an indwelling god is the possession of even the weakest and most failing believer in christ so that it is not a new thing you are to ask for but only to realize that which you already have of every believer in the lord jesus it is absolutely true that his body is the temple of the holy ghost which is in him which he has of god but although this is true it is also equally true that unless the believer knows it and lives in the power of it it is to him as though it were not like the treasures under a man's field which existed there before they were known or used by him so does the life of christ dwell in each believer as really before he knows it and lives in it as it does afterward although its power is not manifested until intelligently and voluntarily the believer ceases from his own life and accepts christ's life in its place but it is very important not to make any mistakes here this union with christ is not a matter of emotions but of character it is not something we are to feel but something we are to be we may feel it very blessedly and probably shall but the vital thing is not the feeling but the reality no one can be one with christ who is not christ-like this is a manifest truth yet i fear it is often too much overlooked and very strong emotions of love and joy are taken as signs and proofs of divine union in cases where the absolutely essential proofs of a christ-like life and character are conspicuously wanting this is entirely contrary to the scripture declaration that he that saith he abideth in him ought himself also to walk even as he walked there is no escape from this for it is not only a divine declaration but is in the very nature of things as well we speak of being one with a friend and we mean that we have a union of purposes and thoughts and desires no matter how enthusiastic our friends may be in their expressions of love and unity there can be no real oneness between us unless there are at least in some degree the same likes and dislikes the same thoughts and purposes and ideals oneness with christ means being made a partaker of his nature as well as of his life for nature and life are of course one if we are really one with christ therefore it will not be contrary to our nature to be christ-like and to walk as he walked but it will be in accordance with our nature sweetness gentleness meekness patience long-suffering charity kindness will all be natural to the christian who is a partaker of the nature of christ it could not be otherwise the people who live in their emotions do not always see this 
they feel so at one with christ that they look no farther than this feeling and often delude themselves with thinking they have come into the divine union when all the while their nature and dispositions are still under the sway of self-love now we all know that our emotions are most untrustworthy and are largely the result of our physical condition or our natural temperaments it is a fatal mistake therefore to make them the test of our oneness with christ this mistake works both ways if i have very joyous emotions i may be deluded by thinking i have entered into the divine union when i have not and if i have no emotions i may grieve over my failure to enter when i really have entered character is the only real test god is holy and those who are one with him will be holy also our lord expressed his oneness with the father in such words as these the son can do nothing of himself but what he seeth the father do for what things soever he doeth these also doeth the son likewise if i do not the works of my father believe me not but if i do though ye believe not me believe the works that ye may know and believe that the father is in me and i in him the test christ gave then by which the reality of his oneness with the father was to be known was the fact that he did the works of the father and i know no other test for us now it is forever true in the nature of things that a tree is to be known by its fruits and if we have entered into the divine union we shall bear the divine fruits of a christ-like life and conversation for he that saith i know him and keepeth not his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him but whoso keepeth his word in him verily is the love of god perfected hereby know we that we are in him hereby know we that is by the keeping of his word pay no regard to your feelings therefore in this matter of oneness with christ but see to it that you have the really vital fruits of a oneness in character and walk and mind your emotions may be very delightful or they may be very depressing in neither case are they any real indications of your spiritual state very undeveloped christians often have very powerful emotional experiences i knew one who was kept awake often by the waves of salvation as she expressed it which swept over her all night long but who yet did not tell the truth in her intercourse with others and was very far from honest in her business dealings no one could possibly believe that she knew anything about a real divine union in spite of all her fervent emotions in regard to it your joy in the lord is to be a far deeper thing than a mere emotion it is to be the joy of knowledge of perception of actual existence it is a far gladder thing to be a bird with all the actual realities of flying than only to feel as if you were a bird with no actual power of flying at all reality is always the vital thing but now having guarded against this danger of an emotional experience of divine union let us consider how the reality is to be reached and first i would say that it is not a new attitude to be taken by god but only a new attitude to be taken by us if i am really a child of god then of necessity my heart is already the temple of god and christ is already within me what is needed therefore is only that i shall recognize his presence and yield fully to his control it seems to me just in this way as though christ were living in a house shut up in a far-off closet unknown and unnoticed by the dwellers in the house longing to make himself known to them and to be one with them in all their daily lives and share in all their interests but unwilling to force himself upon their notice because nothing but a voluntary companionship could meet or satisfy the needs of his love the days pass by over that favored household and they remain in ignorance of their marvelous privilege they come and go about all their daily affairs with no thought of their wonderful guest 
their plans are laid without reference to him his wisdom to guide and his strength to protect are all lost to them lonely days and weeks are spent in sadness which might have been full of the sweetness of his presence but suddenly the announcement is made the lord is in the house how will its owner receive the intelligence will he call out an eager thanksgiving and throw wide open every door for the entrance of his glorious guest or will he shrink and hesitate afraid of his presence and seek to reserve some private corner for a refuge from his all-seeing eye dear friend i make the glad announcement to thee that the lord is in thy heart since the day of thy conversion he has been dwelling there but thou hast lived on in ignorance of it every moment during all that time might have been passed in the sunshine of his sweet presence and every step have been taken under his advice but because thou knew it not and did not look for him there thy life has been lonely and full of failure but now that i make the announcement to thee how wilt thou receive it art thou glad to have him wilt thou throw wide open every door to welcome him in wilt thou joyfully and thankfully give up the government of thy life into his hands wilt thou consult him about everything and let him decide each step for thee and mark out every path wilt thou invite him into thy innermost chambers and make him the sharer in thy most hidden life Wilt thou say yes to all his longing for union with thee, and with a glad and eager abandonment hand thyself and all that concerns thee over into his hands? If thou wilt, then shall thy soul begin to know something of the joy of union with Christ. But words fail me here. All that I can say is but a faint picture of the blessed reality for far more glorious than it would be to have christ a dweller in the house or in the heart is it to be brought into such a real and actual union with him as to be one with him one will one purpose one interest one life human words cannot express such a glory as this and yet it ought to be expressed, and our souls ought to be made so unutterably hungry to realize it that day or night we shall not be able to rest without it. Do you understand the words, one with Christ? Do you catch the slightest glimpse of their marvelous meaning? Does not your whole soul begin to exult over such a wondrous destiny? It seems too wonderful to be true that such poor, weak, foolish beings as we are should be created for such an end as this and yet it is a blessed reality we are even commanded to enter into it we are exhorted to lay down our own life that his life may be lived in us we are asked to have no interests but his interests to share his riches to enter into his joys to partake of his sorrows to manifest his likeness to have the same mind as he had, to think and feel and act and walk as he did. Shall we consent to all this? The Lord will not force it on us, for he wants us as his companions and his friends, and a forced union would be incompatible with this. It must be voluntary on our part. The bride must say a willing yes to the bridegroom, or the joy of their union is wanting can we not say a willing yes to our lord it is a very simple transaction and yet very real the steps are but three first we must be convinced that the scriptures teach this glorious indwelling of god then we must surrender our whole selves to him to be possessed by him and finally we must believe that he has taken possession and is dwelling in us we must begin to reckon ourselves dead and to reckon christ as our only life we must maintain this attitude of soul unwaveringly it will help us to say i am crucified with christ nevertheless i live yet not i but christ liveth in me over and over day and night until it becomes the habitual breathing of our souls we must put off our self-life by faith continually 
and put on the life of Christ. And we must do this not only by faith, but practically as well. We must continually put self to death in all the details of daily life, and must let Christ instead live and work in us. I mean we must never do the selfish thing, but always the Christ-like thing. We must let this become, by its constant repetition, the attitude of our whole being. And as surely as we do, we shall come at last to understand something of what it means to be made one with Christ, as he and the Father are one. Christ left all to be joined to us. Shall we not also leave all to be joined to him, in this divine union which transcends words, but for which our Lord prayed, when he said, neither pray i for these alone but for them also which shall believe on me through their word that they all may be one as thou father art in me and i in thee that they also may be one in us end of chapter eighteen Chapter 19 of The Christian Secret of a Happy Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeff Chestnut. The Christian Secret of a Happy Life by Hannah Whitehall Smith. Chapter 19 the chariots of god it has been well said that earthly cares are a heavenly discipline but they are even something better than discipline they are god's chariots sent to take the soul to its high places of triumph they do not look like chariots they look instead like enemies sufferings trials defeats misunderstandings disappointments unkindnesses they look like juggernaut cars of misery and wretchedness which are only waiting to roll over us and crush us into the earth but could we see them as they really are we should recognize them as chariots of triumph in which we may ride to those very heights of victory for which our souls have been longing and praying the juggernaut car is the visible thing the chariot of god is the invisible the king of Syria came up against the man of God with horses and chariots that could be seen by every eye. But God had chariots that could be seen by none, save the eye of faith. The servant of the prophet could only see the outward and visible, and he cried, as so many have done since, Alas, my master, how shall we do? But the prophet himself sat calmly within his house without fear, because his eyes were open to see the invisible, and all he asked for his servant was, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. This is the prayer we need to pray for ourselves and for one another. Lord, open our eyes that we may see. For the world all around us, as well as around the prophet, is full of God's horses and chariots, waiting to carry us to places of glorious victory. And when our eyes are thus opened, we shall see in all the events of life, whether great or small, whether joyful or sad, a chariot for our souls. Everything that comes to us becomes a chariot the moment we treat it as such, and on the other hand, even the smallest trials may be a juggernaut car to crush us into misery or despair if we so consider them. It lies with each of us to choose which they shall be. It all depends not upon what these events are, but upon how we take them. If we lie down under them and let them roll over us and crush us, they become juggernaut cars. But if we climb up into them as into a car of victory and make them carry us triumphantly onward and upward, they become the chariots of God. Whenever we mount into God's chariots, the same thing happens to us spiritually that happened to Elijah. We shall have a translation, not into the heavens above us as Elijah did, but into the heaven within us. And this, after all, 
is almost a grander translation than his we shall be carried away from the low earthly groveling plane of life where everything hurts and everything is unhappy up into the heavenly places in christ jesus where we can ride in triumph over all below these heavenly places are interior not exterior and the road that leads to them is interior also but the chariot that carries the soul over this road is generally some outward loss or trial or disappointment some chastening that does not indeed seem for the present to be joyous but grievous but that nevertheless afterward yieldeth the peaceable fruits of righteousness to them that are exercised thereby in the canticles we are told of chariots paved with love we cannot always see the love lining to our own particular chariot it often looks very unlovely it may be a cross-grained relative or friend it may be the result of human malice or cruelty or neglect but every chariot sent by god must necessarily be paved with love since god is love and god's love is the sweetest softest tenderest thing to rest oneself upon that was ever found by any soul anywhere it is his love indeed that sends the chariot look upon your chastenings then no matter how grievous they may be for the present as god's chariots sent to carry your souls into the high places of spiritual achievement and uplifting and you will find that they are after all paved with love the bible tells us that when god went forth for the salvation of his people then he did ride upon his horses and chariots of salvation and it is the same now everything becomes a chariot of salvation when god rides upon it he maketh even the clouds his chariot we are told and rideth on the wings of the wind Therefore the clouds and storms that darken our skies and seem to shut out the shining of the sun of righteousness are really only God's chariots into which we may mount with him and ride prosperously over all the darkness. Dear reader, have you made the clouds in your life your chariots? Are you riding prosperously with God on top of them all? I knew a lady who had a very slow servant. She was an excellent girl in every other respect, and very valuable in the household, but her slowness was a constant source of irritation to her mistress, who was naturally quick, and who always chafed at slowness. This lady would consequently get out of temper with the girl twenty times a day, and twenty times a day would repent of her anger and resolve to conquer it, but in vain. Her life was made miserable by the conflict one day it occurred to her that she had for a long while been praying for patience and that perhaps this slow servant was the very chariot the lord had sent to carry her soul over into patience she immediately accepted it as such and from that time used the slowness of her servant as a chariot for her soul and the result was a victory of patience that no slowness of anybody was ever after able to disturb I knew another lady at a crowded convention who was put to sleep in a room with two others on account of the crowd. She wanted to sleep, but they wanted to talk, and the first night she was greatly disturbed and lay there fretting and fuming long after the others had hushed and she might have slept. But the next day she heard something about God's chariots, and at night she accepted these talking friends as her chariots to carry her over into sweetness and patience, and was kept in undisturbed calm. When, however, it grew very late, and she knew they all ought to be sleeping, she ventured to say slyly, Friends, I am lying here riding in a chariot. The effect was instantaneous and perfect quiet reigned. Her chariot had carried her over to victory, not only inwardly but at last outwardly as well if we would ride in god's chariots instead of our own we should find this to be the case continually our constant temptation is to trust in the chariots of egypt or in other words in earthly resources we can see them 
they are tangible and real and look substantial while god's chariots are invisible and intangible and it is hard to believe they are there we try to reach high spiritual places with the multitude of our chariots we depend first on one thing and then on another to advance our spiritual condition and to gain our spiritual victories we go down to egypt for help and god is obliged often to destroy all our own earthly chariots before he can bring us to the point of mounting into his we lean too much upon a dear friend to help us onward in the spiritual life and the lord is obliged to separate us from that friend we feel that all our spiritual prosperity depends on our continuance under the ministry of a favorite preacher and he is mysteriously removed we look upon our prayer meetings or our bible class as the chief source of our spiritual strength and we are shut up from attending them and the chariot of god which alone can carry us to the places where we hope to be taken by the instrumentalities upon which we have been depending is to be found in the very deprivations we have so mourned over god must burn up with the fire of his love every chariot of our own that stands in the way of our mounting into his we have to be brought to the place where all other refuges fail us before we can say he only we say he and something else he and my experience or he and my church relationships or he and my christian work and all that comes after the end must be taken away from us or must be proved useless before we can come to the he only as long as visible chariots are at hand the soul will not mount into the invisible ones let us be thankful then for every trial that will help to destroy our earthly chariots and that will compel us to take refuge in the chariot of god which stands ready and waiting beside us in every event and circumstance of life we are told that god rideth upon the heavens and if we would ride with him there we need to be brought to the end of all riding upon the earth when we mount into god's chariot our goings are established for no obstacles can hinder his triumphal course all losses therefore are gains that bring us to this paul understood this and he gloried in the losses which brought him such unspeakable rewards but what things were gained to me those i counted lost for christ yea doubtless and i count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of christ jesus my lord for whom i have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that i may win christ and be found in him even the thorn in the flesh the messenger of satan sent to buffet him became a chariot of god to his willing soul and carried him to the heights of triumph which he could have reached in no other way to take pleasure in one's trials what is this but to turn them into the grandest of chariots joseph had a revelation of his future triumphs in reigning but the chariots that carried him there looked to the eye of sense like dreadful juggernaut cars of failure and defeat slavery and imprisonment are strange chariots to take one to a kingdom and yet by no other way could joseph have reached his exaltation and our exaltation to the spiritual throne that awaits us is often reached by similar chariots the great point then is to have our eyes open to see in everything that comes to us a chariot of god and to learn how to mount into these chariots we must recognize each thing that comes to us as being really god's chariot for us and must accept it as being from him he does not command or originate the thing perhaps but the moment we put it into his hands it becomes his and he at once turns it into a chariot for us he makes all things even bad things work together for good to all who trust him all he needs is to have it entirely committed to him when your trial comes then 
put it right into the will of God and climb into that will as a little child climbs into its mother's arms. The baby carried in the chariot of its mother's arms rides triumphantly through the hardest places and does not even know they are hard. And how much more we, who are carried in the chariot of the arms of God. Get into your chariot, then. Take each thing that is wrong in your lives as God's chariot for you. No matter who the builder of the wrong may be, whether men or devils, by the time it reaches your side, it is God's chariot for you and is meant to carry you to a heavenly place of triumph. Shut out all the second causes and find the Lord in it. Say, Lord, open my eyes that I may see, not the visible enemy, but thy unseen chariots of deliverance. No doubt the enemy will try to turn your chariot into a juggernaut car by taunting you with the suggestion that God is not in your trouble and that there is no help for you in him. But you must utterly disregard all suggestions and must overcome them with the assertion of a confident faith. God is my refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble, must be your continual declaration no matter what the seemings may be. Moreover, you must not be half-hearted about it. You must climb wholly into your chariot, not with one foot dragging on the ground. There must be no ifs or buts or supposings or questionings. You must accept God's will fully and must hide yourself in the arms of His love that are always underneath to receive you in every circumstance and at every moment. Say, Thy will be done. Thy will be done, over and over. Shut out every other thought but the one thought of submission to His will and of trust in His love. There can be no trials in which God's will has not a place somewhere and the soul has only to mount into his will as in a chariot, and it will find itself riding upon the heavens with God in a way it had never dreamed could be. The soul that thus rides with God on the sky has views and sights of things that the soul which grovels on the earth can never have. The poor, crushed, and bleeding victim under the car of Juggernaut can see only the dust and stones and the grinding wheels, but the triumphant rider in the chariot sees far fairer sights. Do any of you ask where your chariots are to be found? The psalmist says, The chariots of God are twenty thousand, even thousands of angels. There is never in any life a lack of chariots. One dear Christian said to me at the close of a meeting where I had been speaking about these chariots, I am a poor woman and have all my life long grieved that I could not drive in a carriage like some of my rich neighbors. But I have been looking over my life while you have been talking, and I find that it is so full of chariots on every side that I am sure I shall never need to walk again. I have not a shadow of doubt, dear readers, that if all our eyes could be opened today, we should see our homes and our places of business and the streets we traverse filled with the chariots of God. There is no need for any one of us to walk for lack of chariots. That cross inmate of your household who has hitherto made life a burden to you and who has been the juggernaut car to crush your soul into the dust may henceforth be a glorious chariot to carry you to the heights of heavenly patience and long-suffering. That misunderstanding, that mortification, that unkindness, that disappointment, that loss, that defeat, all these chariots are waiting to carry you to the very heights of victory you have so longed to reach. Mount into them, then, with thankful hearts, and lose sight of all second causes in the shining of his love, who will carry you in his arms safely and triumphantly over it all. End of chapter 19 Recording by Jeff Chestnut
Chapter Twenty of the Christian Secret of a Happy Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Christian Secret of a Happy Life by Hannah Whittall Smith. Chapter Twenty, The Life on Wings. This life hid with Christ and God has many aspects and can be considered under a great many different figures. There is one aspect which has been a great help and inspiration to me, and I think may be also to some other longing and hungry souls. It is what I call the life on wings. Our Lord has not only told us to consider the flowers of the field, but also the birds of the air, and I have found that these little winged creatures have some wonderful lessons for us. In one of the Psalms, the psalmist, after enumerating the darkness and bitterness of his life in this earthly sphere of trial, cries out, Oh, that I had wings like a dove, for then would I fly away and be at rest. Lo, then would I wander far off and remain in the wilderness. I would hasten my escape from the windy storm and tempest. This cry for wings is old as humanity. Our souls were made to mount up with wings, and they can never be satisfied with anything short of flying. Like the captive-born eagle that feels within it the instinct of flight and chafes and threats at its imprisonment, hardly knowing what it longs for, so do our souls chafe and fret and cry out for freedom. We can never rest on earth, and we long to fly away from all that so holds and hampers and imprisons us here. This restlessness and discontent develop themselves generally in seeking an outward escape from our circumstances or from our miseries. We do not at first recognize the fact that our only way of escape is to mount up with wings, and we try to flee on horses as the Israelites did when oppressed by their trials. Our horses are the outward things upon which we depend for relief, some change of circumstances or some help from man, and we mount on these and run east or west or north or south, anywhere to get away from our trouble, thinking in our ignorance that a change of our environment is all that is necessary to give deliverance to our souls. But all such efforts to escape are unavailing, as we have each one proved hundreds of times. For the soul is not so made that it can flee upon horses, but must make its flight always upon wings. Moreover, these horses generally carry us, as they did the Israelites, out of one trouble only to land us in another. It is as the prophet says, as if a man did flee from a lion, and a bear met him, or went into the house and leaned his hand on the wall, and a serpent bit him. How often have we also run from some lion in our pathway only to be met by a bear, or have hidden ourselves in a place of supposed safety only to be bitten by a serpent? No, it is useless for the soul to hope to escape by running away from its troubles to any earthly refuge, for there is not one that can give it deliverance. Is there then no way of escape for us when in trouble or distress? Must we just plod wearily through it all and look for no relief? I rejoice to answer that there is a glorious way of escape for every one of us, if we will but mount up on wings and fly away from it all to God. It is not a way east or west, north or south, but it is a way upwards. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, they shall mount up with wings as eagles, they shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. All creatures that have wings can escape from every snare that is set for them, if only they will fly high enough, and the soul that uses its wings can always find a sure way to escape from all that can hurt or trouble it. What then are these wings? Their secret is contained in the words, They that wait upon the Lord. The soul that waits upon the Lord is the soul that is entirely surrendered to Him, and that trusts Him perfectly. Therefore we might name our wings the wings of surrender and of trust. I mean by this that if we will only surrender ourselves utterly to the Lord, and we will trust Him perfectly, we shall find our souls mounting up with wings as eagles to the heavenly places in Christ Jesus where the earthly annoyances or sorrows have no power to disturb us. 
the wings of the soul carry it up into a spiritual plane of life into the life hid with christ in god which is a life utterly independent of circumstances and that no cage can imprison and no shackles bind the things above are the things the soul on wings cares about not the things on the earth and it views life and all its experiences from the high altitude of heavenly places in christ jesus things look very different according to the standpoint from which we view them the caterpillar as it creeps along the ground must have a widely different view of the world around it from that which the same caterpillar will have when its wings are developed and it soars in the air above the very place where it once crawled and similarly the crawling soul must necessarily see things in a very different aspect from the soul that has mounted up with wings the mountain top may blaze with sunshine when all the valley below is shrouded in fogs and the birds whose wings can carry him high enough may mount at will out of the gloom below into the joy of the sunlight above i was at one time spending a winter in london and during three long months we did not once see any genuine sunshine because of the dense clouds of smoke that hung over the city like a pall but many a time i have seen that above the smoke the sun was shining and once or twice through a rift i have had a glimpse of a bird with sunshine on his wings sailing above the fog in the clear blue of the sunlit sky not all the brushes in london could sweep away the fog but could we only mount high enough we should reach a region above it all and this is what the soul on wings does it overcomes the world through faith to overcome means to come over not to be crushed under and the soul on wings flies over the world and the things of it these lose their power to hold or bind the spirit that can come over them on the wings of surrender and trust that spirit is made in very truth more than conqueror birds overcome the lower law of gravitation by the higher law of flight and the soul on wings overcomes the lower law of sin and misery and bondage by the higher law of spiritual flying the law of the spirit of life in christ jesus must necessarily be a higher and more dominant law than the law of sin and death therefore the soul that has mounted into this upper region of the life in christ cannot fail to conquer and triumph but it may be asked how is it then that all christians do not always triumph i answer that it is because a great many christians do not mount up with wings into this higher plane of life at all they live on the same low level with their circumstances and instead of flying over them they try to fight them on their own earthly plane on this plane the soul is powerless it has no weapons with which to conquer there and instead of overcoming or coming over the trials and sorrows of the earthly life it is overcome by them and crushed under them we all know as i have said that things look differently to us according to our point of view trials assume a very different aspect when looked down upon from above than when viewed from their own level what seems like an impassable wall on its own level becomes an insignificant line to the eyes that see it from the top of a mountain and the snares and sorrows that assume such immense proportion while we look at them on the earthly plane becomes insignificant little motes in the sunshine when the soul has mounted on wings to the heavenly places above them a friend once illustrated to me the difference between three of her friends in the following way she said if they should all three come to a spiritual mountain which had to be crossed the first one would tunnel through it with hard and wearisome labor the second would meander around it in an indefinite fashion hardly knowing where she was going and yet because her aim was right getting around it at last but the third she said would just flap her wings and fly right over i think we must all know something of these different ways of locomotion and i trust if any of us in the past have tried to tunnel our way through the mountains that have stood across our pathway or have been meandering around them that we may from henceforth resolve to spread our wings and mount up into the clear atmosphere of god's presence where it will be easy to overcome or come over the highest mountain of them all i say spread our wings and mount up because not the largest wings ever known can lift a bird one inch upward unless they are used 
we must use our wings or they avail us nothing it is not worth while to cry out oh that i had wings and then i would flee for we have the wings already and what is needed is not more wings but only that we should use those we have the power to surrender and trust exists in every human soul and only needs to be brought into exercise with these two wings we can flee to god at any moment but in order really to reach him we must actively use them we must not merely want to use them but we must do it definitely and actively a passive surrender or a passive trust will not do i mean this very practically we shall not mount up very high if we only surrender and trust in theory or in our especially religious moments we must do it definitely and practically about each detail of daily life as it comes to us we must meet our disappointments our thwartings our persecutions our malicious enemies our provoking friends our trials and temptations of every sort with an active and experimental attitude of surrender and trust we must spread our wings and mount up to the heavenly places in christ above them all where they will lose their power to harm or distress us for from these high places we shall see things through the eye of christ and all the earth will be glorified in the heavenly vision the dove hath neither claw nor sting nor weapon for the fight she owes her safety to the wing her victory to flight the bridegroom opes his arms of love and in them folds the panting dove how changed our lives would be if we could only fly through the days on these wings of surrender and trust instead of stirring up strife and bitterness by trying metaphorically to knock down and walk over our offending brothers and sisters we should escape all strife by simply spreading our wings and mounting up to the heavenly region where our eyes would see all things covered with a mantle of christian love and pity our souls were made to live in this upper atmosphere and we stifle and choke on any lower level our eyes were made to look off from these heavenly heights and our vision is distorted by any lower gazing it is a great blessing therefore that our loving father in heaven has mercifully arranged all the discipline of our lives with a view to teaching us to fly in deuteronomy we have a picture of how this teaching is done as an eagle stirreth up her nest fluttereth over her young spreadeth abroad her wings taketh them beareth them on her wings so the lord alone did lead him and there was no strange god with him the mother eagle teaches her little ones to fly by making their nest so uncomfortable that they are forced to leave it and commit themselves to the unknown world of air outside and just so does our god to us he stirs up our comfortable nests and pushes us over the edge of them and we are forced to use our wings to save ourselves from fatal falling read your trials in this light and see if you cannot begin to get a glimpse of their meaning your wings are being developed i knew a lady whose life was one long strain of trial from a cruel wicked drunken husband there was no possibility of human help and in her despair she was driven to use her wings and fly to god and during the long years of trial her wings grew so strong from constant flying that at last she told me when the trials were at their hardest it seemed to her as if her soul was carried over them on a beautiful rainbow and found itself in a peaceful resting place on the other side with this end in view we can surely accept with thankfulness every trial that compels us to use our wings for only so they can grow strong and large and fit for the highest flying unused wings gradually wither and shrink and lose their flying power and if we had nothing in our lives that made flying necessary we might perhaps at last lose all capacity to fly but you may ask are there no hindrances to flying even where the wings are strong and the soul is trying hard to use them i answer yes a bird may be imprisoned in a cage or it may be tethered to the ground with a cord or it may be loaded with a weight that drags it down or it may be entrapped in the snare of the fowler and hindrances which answer to all of these in the spiritual realm may make it impossible for the soul to fly 
until it has been set free from them by the mighty power of God. One snare of the fowler that entraps many souls is the snare of doubt. The doubts look so plausible and often so humble that Christians walk into their snare without dreaming for a moment that it is a snare at all, until they find themselves caught and unable to fly. For there is no more possibility of flying for the soul that doubts than there is for the bird caught in the fowler's snare. The reason of this is evident. One of our wings, namely the wing of trust, is entirely disabled by the slightest doubt. And just as it requires two wings to lift a bird in the air, so does it require two wings to lift a soul. A great many people do everything but trust. They spread the wing of surrender and use it vigorously and wonder why it is that they do not mount up, never dreaming that it is because all the while the wing of trust is hanging idly by their sides. It is because Christians use one wing only that their efforts to fly are often so irregular and fruitless. Look at a bird with a broken wing trying to fly, and you will get some idea of the kind of motion all one-sided flying must make. We must use both our wings, or not try to fly at all. It may be that for some the snare of the fowler is some subtle form of sin, some hidden want of consecration. Where this is the case, the wing of trust may seem to be all right, but the wing of surrender hangs idly down, and it is just as hopeless to try to fly with the wing of trust alone as with the wing of surrender alone. Both wings must be used, or no flying is possible. Or perhaps the soul may feel as if it were in a prison from which it cannot escape, and consequently is debarred from mounting up on wings. No earthly bars can ever imprison the soul. No walls, however high, or bolts, however strong, can imprison an eagle, so long as there is an open way upward, and earth's power can never hold the soul in prison, while the upward way is kept open and free. Our enemies may build walls around us as high as they please, but they cannot build any barrier between us and God, and if we mount up with wings, we can fly higher than any of their walls can ever reach. If we find ourselves in prison, then, we may be sure of this, that it is not our earthly environment that constitutes our prison house, for the soul's wings scorn all paltry bars and walls of earth's making. The only thing that can really imprison the soul is something that hinders its upward flight. The prophet tells us that it is our iniquities that have separated between us and our God, and our sins that have hid his face from us. Therefore, if our soul is imprisoned, it must be because some indulged sin has built a barrier between us and the Lord, and we cannot fly until the sin is given up and put out of the way. But often where there is no conscious sin, the soul is still unconsciously tethered to something of earth, and so struggles in vain to fly. A party of my friends once got into a boat in Norway to row around one of the fjords there. They took their seats and began to row vigorously, but the boat made no headway. They put out more strength and rowed harder than before, but all in vain. Not an inch did the boat move. Then one of the party suddenly recollected that the boat had not been unmoored, and he exclaimed, No wonder we could not get away when we were trying to pull the whole continent of Europe after us. And just so our souls are often not unmoored from earthly things, we must cut ourselves loose. As well might an eagle try to fly with a hundred ton weight tied fast to its feet, as the soul try to mount up with wings while a weight of earthly cares and anxieties is holding it down to the earth. When our Lord was trying to teach his disciples concerning this danger, he told them a parable of a great supper to which many who were invited failed to come, because they were hindered by their earthly cares. One had bought a piece of ground, another a yoke of oxen, and a third had married a wife, and they felt that all these things needed their care. Wives or oxen or land or even very much smaller things may be the cords that tether the soul from flying or the weights that hold it down. Let us then cut every cord and remove every barrier that our souls may find no hindrance to their mounting up with wings as eagles to heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We are commanded to have our hearts filled with song of rejoicing and to make inward melody to the Lord. 
but unless we mount up with wings this is impossible for the only creature that can sing is the creature that flies when the prophet declared that though all the world should be desolate yet he would rejoice in god and joy in the god of his salvation his soul was surely on wings paul knew what it was to use his wings when he found himself to be sorrowful yet always rejoicing on the earthly plain all was dark to both paul and the prophet but on the heavenly plain all was brightest sunshine do you know anything of this life on wings dear reader do you mount up continually to god out of and above earth's cares and trials to that higher plane of life where all is peace and triumph or do you plod wearily along unfit through the midst of your trials and let them overwhelm you at every turn let us however guard against a mistake here do not think that by flying i mean necessarily any very joyous emotions or feelings or exhilaration there is a great deal of emotional flying that is not really flying at all it is such flying as a feather accomplishes which is driven upward by a strong puff of wind but flutters down again as soon as the wind ceases to blow the flying i mean is a matter of principle not a matter of emotion it may be accompanied by very joyous emotions but it does not depend on them it depends only upon the facts of an entire surrender and an absolute trust every one who will honestly use these two wings and will faithfully persist in using them will find that they have mounted up with wings as an eagle no matter how empty of all emotion they may have felt themselves to be before for the promise is sure they that wait upon the lord shall mount up with wings as eagles not may perhaps mount up but shall it is the inevitable result may we each one prove it for ourselves the lark soars singing from its nest and tells aloud his trust in god and so is blessed let come what cloud he has no store he sows no seed yet sings aloud and doth not heed through cloudy day or scanty feed he sings to shame men who forget in fear of need a father's name the heart that trusts forever sings and fills as light as it has wings a well of peace within it springs come good or ill whatever to-day or morrow bring it is his will end of chapter twenty recording by jendia end of the christian's secret of a happy life by hannah whittle smith